Dr. Dune.
The ship bring an immediate return. Shoot the radar into the ground and the bone bounces the image back. Bounces it back. This new program's incredible. A few more years development and we won't even have to dig anymore. Where's the fun in that? It's a little distorted, but I don't think it's a computer. Oh. Postmortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments. Velociraptor? Yeah, it's good shape, too. Five, six feet high, I'm guessing nine feet long. Look at the extraordinary... What did you do? He touched it. <laughs> Dr. Grant's not machine compatible. Oh, got it in for me. <laughs> uh, look at the half-moon-shaped bones on the wrist. It's no one of these guys learn how to fly. That doesn't look very scary. <laughs> More like a six-foot turkey. <laughs> turkey. Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present-day birds than they do with reptiles. Look at the pubic bone, turned backward, just like a bird. Look at the vertebrae, full of air sacs and hollows, more just like, like a, a bird. six-foot turkey. <laughs> Six foot turkey. Turkey. Huh? Six foot turkey. Okay. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. <gasps> Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. Get your first look at this 
six foot turkey and see whether it clear it. Well, hello, hello there, everybody. And welcome to Paleontologizing. Who is this? Uh, thank you, thank you, Paleonerd Italiano, for the raid. Holy cow, I'm starting the stream off right today. Paleonerd, thank you, thank you for that remarkable raid, and uh, welcome to Paleontologizing. Holy moly. Uh... I start an hour early, and I get raids from a wonderful streamers like you, Paleonerd. Thank you, thank you for that. Great to have you here. Welcome, everybody, to Paleontologizing. We're going to have a super fun special stream today, talking about Rudolph Zallinger's Age of Reptiles mural. Even if you don't think you know what this is, chances are you have seen it before. It has been tremendously influential on the history of dinosaurs and popular culture, and also... It helped inspire a generation of paleontologists, too. We'll be talking all about it, because it was on this very day, back in 1942, that Rudolf Zellinger was first hired by the Yale Peabody Museum to create some art for their Hall of Ancient Reptiles. Their dinosaur hall. Anyway, we're going to be talking all about that. Uh, and again, the, uh, the Age of Reptiles mural... There we go. Yeah. You may have seen the tweet earlier. But here it is. Yeah, here's a link. Um, but we talked a little bit about this last week. In fact, we watched this clip last week. When we were talking about Deinonychus. It all comes full circle. But anyway, welcome, welcome everybody. And if it's anybody's very first time here, like I saw Phaseria earlier, welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Shoot, it's great to have you here. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, as you could probably guess. Looking at my office here, I uh, I work on dinosaurs. I dig up dinosaurs with various museums across the western U.S. and places like Utah, Montana, Wyoming. And there's that notification again, paleo nerd. Thank you. <laughs> we got double notifications here. I can't tell you why, but it's great to have that. Paleo Nerd, thank you, thank you for your raid. Anyway, yeah, I dig up dinosaurs with various museums across the western U.S. I study dinosaurs, I publish on them in the scientific literature, and nowadays I talk about dinosaurs five days a week right here on Twitch. So uh, if that sounds interesting to you, then holy cow, are you in the right place? And if you've got questions, and who doesn't have questions about dinosaurs about evolution, extinction, natural history. You know, the, the history of life on our incredible planet Earth. Everybody's got questions about that kind of thing. So don't be shy with those questions. I'm here to answer them for you. There's a live broadcast so I can answer those questions live. So just type them in a the chat. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, before we get to... Well, here, let me just show you this real quick. Uh, from the announcement tweet today. Can I make this bigger? Yeah. There we are. I'd like to introduce you to the largest painting in the world. <laughs> it portrays time over a span of about 350 million years. That's what we're talking about today. The Devonian period back in the Paleozoic. Yeah. Up to the end of the dinosaur era, the end of the Mesozoic. Called the Age of Reptiles. The Age of Reptiles. <laughs> uh, yeah. Here's the old picture. Thank you, Helix Fossil. 
pea-brained giants lumbering through lush tropical foliage. This is what we thought in the 40s, you know? And grass. Yeah. For years, the stereotype was magnificently represented by this mural. Yes, Since indeed. Since the 40s, when it was painted, a number of discoveries have been made and new ideas have been thrown into the debate. And perhaps one of the most important discoveries was made by me. <laughs> Good on you, John Ostrom. The discovery of Deinonychus, whom we talked about on Friday's broadcast. You can go back and watch the VOD for that, or you can catch it on the YouTube page, too, because I think it's up there now, isn't it? Um, there we go. Uh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed it is. Uh, excellent. Yeah, this would have been February 24th. We were talking all about Deinonychus, and I'm wearing a special Deinonychus shirt. There we go. Deinonychus. Right there. So anyway, check that out. Uh, here's a link to that video, if you'd like to see it. So yeah, yeah. And such an incredible mural. Your appreciation for the Age of Reptiles mural will increase by a thousand percent during this broadcast. I guarantee it, Invisible Dimensions. Yes. Uh, an RPG fan. I appreciate your zeal there, RPG fan, but adding feathers to those would be... It's a historical artifact, you know? Yeah. We'll talk about why it's... That mural is more valuable as, you know, as a, a representation of what we thought about dinosaurs during the mid-20th century. So yeah, that mural also helped inspire, believe it or not, the design of everybody's favorite kaiju, King of the Monsters, Godzilla. Godzilla's design was inspired by Rudolph Zellinger's Age of Reptiles mural. We'll be talking about why today. So stay tuned. But before we get to any of that, let me scroll up to the top of chat and say hello to everybody. Nerf Dermer was first today. How are you doing, Nerf Dermer? Welcome, welcome. Hope you're doing well, Nerf Dermer. It's good to see you. Yeah. And who else have we got? Arle, 0501. How you doing, Arle? Welcome, welcome, Tradoon, to you too. Hope you're having a good Wednesday. Uh, FMSSK. This is perfect timing as always. Especially with me being early today, FMSSK. Yeah, good vibes, let's go. Great to have you here, FMS. Phazaria is here too. How are you doing, Faye? I wouldn't blame you, Phazaria, if you've already gone off to do other things. That was a long intro segment. Um, so if you're still not here, if you're not still here, Faye, I totally understand. But it was great raiding into you the other day, and uh, we ought to do that again soon when you're doing some science. Yeah, doing some microscopy. Blinkster, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Blinkster. Hello, that Texas cryptid. How are ya? Golgonek. Always lovely to see you, Golgonek. I hope you're doing really well. Welcome, welcome, Golgonek. It, it brings my heart joy to see you here every day, Golgonek. So thank you for being such a stalwart supporter and a top-tier paleontologizing viewer. Uh... Yeah, Paleo Stream. How are you doing? Are, are you still here, Yashua? Uh, is Forgotten Bloodlines the uh, the like independent animated series with the Entelodonts? They may have been Deodon. We might have to watch that today, actually. Watch the trailer for it. But welcome, Paleo Stream. I hope things are good. I also got your message, your DM on Twitter, and I need to respond to it. So yeah, I am definitely still interested, Paleo Stream. I just think got to think about what I would want to contribute to discussion there. But yeah, I'd love to participate, and I am flattered that you would ask me. Metal Meows, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Great to see you. Crystal Alpaca, what's shaking? Howdy, howdy. The Trek Nerd, hi to you too. How are ya? Uh, Dixie Q42 has returned to us as well. Dixie Q242. Let me get it right. Thanks for being here, Dixie. Nothing more variants. Demands a refund. Nothing more. I'm glad you're here. Luckily, this is a free broadcast. You might have to watch an ad every once in a while, about once an hour, if you're not subscribed. But you stick around, you're going to get yourself a gift sub. That's uh, that's an inevitability. You know? Uh, great to have you here. Nothing more variant. 
And Dither Double O has subscribed for three months now, Dither. Dither does not have to watch any ads at all. Plus, they get all of those emotes. Dither, thank you, thank you for your ongoing support. It means a bunch to me. It keeps me here on the air, and uh, for that, I am deeply grateful. Who else have we got? Blinkster 2. Howdy, howdy, Blinkster. Bat Meddler. Yeah, dinosaurs. Good to have you here, Bat Meddler. And uh, Not the Brain. Hello to you, too. Welcome, welcome, Not the Brain. Yeah, call me Farf. Farf. I love your new name. Uh, you were originally far from Groovin, and I started calling you Farf, and you changed your name to call me Farf? <laughs> Farf, I appreciate you. It's great to have you here. And um, I'm flattered that you would listen to... I don't know. That somehow my uh, harebrained schemes would be... Uh, I don't know. Would, would amuse you as much as they amused me. Thank you, Farf. Yeah. Uh, who else do we have got? We scroll down, scroll down. Invisible Dimensions. Howdy, howdy, Invisible. Welcome. Great to see you here. Invisible Dimensions, by the way, super cool fabric that you made for uh, for Lordy for her stream. She is super excited about that. And she told me what an involved process that was. Really neat. Oh, let's hear it. Very nice, Extina Dirt. Extina DWP. Extina, thank you so much for the raid and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here and thank you, thank you. And thank you, Monroe46, for your follow. Welcome, welcome. Did you come in here with Extina? Extina, how was your stream? I hope it was really good. Welcome to Paleontologizing. You caught us right at the beginning, right before we get to the, you know, the veggie patty and potatoes of our stream today to uh to modernize a f turn of phrase thanks tina i'm so glad you're here i hope you had a wonderful stream welcome back to paleontologizing yeah uh and folks if you're not yet following x tina or paleo nerd italiano shoot can we get another shout out for paleo nerd italiano who raided earlier Go take a look at these channels, everybody, and see if you might want to give them a follow. I'm sure they'd really appreciate it, and I'm sure they do really, really cool stuff. If they're bringing viewers here, you know, that's a mark in their favor. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, RPG fan, how are you doing? Hello, hello to you. Welcome, welcome. Duck Admirer has returned to us as well. Welcome back, Duck Admirer. Howdy, howdy. And uh, speaking of ducks... Or duck billed dinosaurs. Thank you, Timothy OWO, for your follow. Appreciate you. Welcome, welcome, Timothy. And Cephalon Wolf, thank you. You've gotten us kicked off with our sub goal for the day. Check that out. One. One out of 40. Dink, dink, dink. There we go. Real mean kid. With six inch daggers for teeth. He was the terror of his neighborhood. That is terrifying, uninvited guest. You have six-inch teeth? Six-inch daggers for teeth? I hope you don't brandish them against us, uninvited guest. But you know what? I'm going to defy your username and invite you in. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. And somebody's interested in some ukulele here. Hogan883. Holy cow. Thank you very, very much Hogan for those five gift subs. Really wants ukulele with those five gift subs. Hogan, holy cow. Five gift subs from Hogan. Really appreciate that, Hogan. Thank you, thank you. Look, we're at six out of 40 now. Exquisite. That's wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Hogan. Holy moly. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. The paleontologist field isn't narrow to what we understand. On the contrary, we stretch our understanding to try and take in the universe. I suppose that's true. And thank you, thank you, Eddie Scarin, for the follow. Five hundred bits goes a long way towards supporting science. I'll click here on Twitch. And holy cow, just outdoors for ukulele time. Just outdoors. Thank you, thank you for that. I really appreciate those five hundred bits. That literally 
puts food on my table or in my vegetable crisper in the refrigerator, so to speak. Not even so to speak, literally. And Lordy, thank you. 243 bits from Lordy. It's a very specific number, Lordy. Thank you, thank you. For once, I'm not starting at the same time as you, Lordy. The bone wall is so thin, it's about the same dimension as the wall of a dirt. A dirter. A dirter is one of those things you get at the end of the paper towels, the cardboard thing in the middle, you go dirt. Yeah. Dirt well, that's what this thing is like. Everybody knows what a dirter is, right? You suggest date. How long would it take a non-avian dinosaur to incubate? That's a that's a great question, Victorious. Not not all that long. Thank you very much for the one hundred. Uh, on par with some birds, probably. Um, and Hogan, thank you for the hundred bits. Really appreciate that. It would take I don't know a dinosaur egg. Depends what kind of dinosaur we're talking about. Um, I don't know. A good clue for that would be look up like what does it take a I don't know a saltwater crocodile, for instance. How long do their eggs take to incubate? That would probably give you some kind of idea for a dinosaur, you know? A non-avian dinosaur. And thank you. <laughs> dur, dur, dur. Indeed, Golganek, thank you so much for those 200 bits. Really appreciate that. Good stuff. We've got, holy cow, we're approaching a level three hype train. If we get to a level five, I will play you some ukulele songs about science. So let's see if we can get there. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, and Eddie Scarin says, what do you think about 65, the movie? Eddie Scarin, holy cow, stay tuned. When I get to the bottom of chat, I'll play you a video that I made about that. Because I have a video about 65, and I hope it makes you laugh. Welcome, Eddie Scarin. Great to have you here. Let me try and get down to the bottom of chat. And let me know you're still here, Eddie. I want to make sure. Uninvited guest? This is Raid from Japan, from Christina. Thank you again, Christina. I really appreciate that. Oh, X-Tina means Christina. I get it now. Christina, thank you, thank you. And, uh, how are you? Coming from Japan, that's pretty awesome. Which part of Japan? I just re recognized that, uh, the other day we were talking about a dinosaur that I dug up that, uh, has recently made an appearance in Japan. Um, yeah, where was that? Let's see. Uh, uh, it's going to be tricky to find it. But, um, nope, oh, there it is. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. This is a Triceratops specimen that I helped dig up back in 2011. It's at the... I think it's in Mufune, Japan? Let's see. I helped dig this critter up. Part of the skull and then part of the, the postcrania, the the skeleton behind the head. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, let's see. The Mifune Museum. In Kumamoto, Japan, which is in oh boy, I don't know where, which prefecture, I'm not sure. Successful group would dominate and it would last forever. Can't really watch too often right now, but I keep supporting if I can. Thank you, thank you, Elias. I really appreciate your continued support. That means a tremendous amount to me. It really does. Thank you, Elias. That's admirable. Holy cow! Yeah, even if you can't watch all that often, you still. I want to support Science Outreach here on Twitch. I'm deeply grateful. Thank you for your support. And we've got two minutes left now. We'll see if we can get up to a level three hype train on our way to ukulele time. We'll see. But anyway, Timothy Owo, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Bebop29, how are you? Sorry it's taking me so long to get to your messages. You raided in just when I was uh, uh, making my way down through chat. Yeah... Uh, Hogan says, always glad to be here, Danny. I'm always glad when you're here, Hogan. Thank you, thank you. A tier three subscriber. That is, uh, that's like legendary status right there, Hogan. I appreciate your continued support. That means so much to me. It really does. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, 
great stuff. Yeah. Okay to play. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. This is okay. That's cool. Or oh, that's so cool. Thank you. Okay to play. Yeah. Well, in my opinion, one of the best looking Triceratops ever dug up is Yoshi's trike. Uh, Yoshi Katsura, who's a Japanese paleontologist, was the one who discovered it in uh, in uh, Montana's Garfield County, Hell Creek Formation. About 67 million years old, give or take. Uh, from the middle Hell Creek Formation. Now, honestly, the mount that they have here in Japan, a zillion times better than the goofy-looking one we have in Montana. Um... They really kind of botched the one in, uh, at Museum of the Rockies. This looks a zillion times better. But it's crowded in among all these other dinosaurs. I see a Spinosaur. A Pachycephalosaur looks... Is that Pachycephalosaur? Looks like Pachycephalosaur. Yeah, there's the skull. Weird angle. A little Alvarosaur right there. One of my favorite dinosaurs. Yeah, anyway. Cool stuff. Uh, and a saltwater crocodile... Uh, will hatch between, oh, 80 to 90 days. Very cool, Victarious. Dinosaur eggs are probably the eggs of various non-avian dinosaurs, as varied as they were, as diverse as non-avian dinosaurs were. Most of those would probably be somewhere around there. You have too long of an incubation period for your egg, and you're at a distinct disadvantage, because eggs are pretty vulnerable. The longer they sit there, the more likely it it is that they'll get eaten or stepped on or, you know, washed away by uh, an overflowing river or whatever, you know? So yeah, 80 to 90 days sounds just about right. That sounds like the Goldilocks zone for like a Mesozoic dinosaur egg incubation period, but yeah. And uh, Gianmi, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And yes, Christina, I'm in Kyoto. I talk about Japan often and my stream's mostly Kyoto. Today I uh, was about Hinamatsuri Doll Festival. Very cool, Christina. Very cool indeed. Yeah. Now, uh, Kyoto, is that on Honshu? Or is that on... Let's see, it goes... Hokkaido, Honshu... Not Mosura, that's, that's a giant moth. Uh, Hokkaido, Honshu, Kyushu... And, shoot, what's the fourth one? There's four major home islands in Japan. What's the fourth one, everybody? People know. I can't remember. Hokkaido, Honshu, Kyushu, and... Shikoku, is that right? Thank you, Xtina. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, hear you, but that's a... a a World War II aircraft carrier was the Hear You. Hear You, Saw You, uh. But yeah. Musashi, Yamato, those are big uh, battleships. Anyway, thank you, Xtina. Uh, Christina. And Kyoto is on Honshu, roughly in the middle of it. Thank you, Xtina. Japanese geography isn't what it used to be. Someday, hopefully, I'll get to visit Japan, because, man, are there a lot of beautiful dinosaur museums in Japan. Japan doesn't have very many dinosaurs from that country, but uh, the Japanese people certainly love dinosaurs. And uh, some of my colleagues, such as Lee Hall and John Scanella of Museum of the Rockies, they go to Japan and, yeah, uh, I think the Mifune Museum in, uh, in where? In Kumamoto, uh, they've got a pretty tight relationship with Museum of the Rockies. And so, like, we're always sending fossil casts and stuff there. So, yeah. Yeah. Someday. Hopefully, I'll have a chance to visit Japan and talk about dinosaurs there. Um, yeah. Yeah, anyway. And Western Capital, if I remember my Japanese correctly. Is that right? No. Yeah, because Tokyo wasn't always the capital. Yeah. Edo, it used to be called back in the day. Hundreds of years ago, uh, Tokyo was called Edo, right? Anyway, Balint, Cyant Streams, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Cyant Streams. Did you get my email earlier? I hope you're doing well. Let me check. 
see if you've responded. Not yet. I sent it just a little while ago. Anyway, Valent. Hope you're doing well. Hope Lita's doing well. Hope baby Alona and the cats are doing well. Uh, and if anybody, of course, if anybody's not yet following Cyan streams, you're messing out too. Um, quite possibly Twitch's premier scientist. Premier PhD scientist? Premier systems biologist? And, uh... Yeah, go, go follow Belint at Science Streams if you're not yet doing so. So, yeah. Almost done with the item. Oh. Thank you, Science Streams. Yeah. And uh, Tokyo was called Ido. Uh, talking to Ido. Oh, very cool. I thought so, Christina. I thought so. Yeah. Um. But yeah. And Lordy says, Eager Beaver Danny. Yes, indeed, Lordy. Holy cow. Belint and I are trying to cook something up. Just cross your fingers, it goes through. Uh, can't say too much about it yet, but... Um, can't. I don't know if I want to say anything about it yet. But uh, uh, cross your fingers. We could have some exciting Twitch science stuff in the pipeline. So yeah, yeah. And uh, TMK says, you know, you know, Google has a T-Rex sculpture outside their building. Really, TMK? I've driven by the Google headquarters before, down in Mountain View. I also live here in uh, in the beautiful, sunny San Francisco Bay Area. <laughs> Although I live in the East Bay, and uh, Google's headquarters is down in the South Bay. Uh, yeah, I've seen all their their bicycles and stuff. And they've got so many like Google bicycles around. But um, really, does Google have a, a Tyrannosaurus skull outside their headquarters? Let's check this out. Google Tyrannosaurus skull, Google headquarters. Wait, really? You're kidding me. That's the Wonkle Rex. This is my T-Rex. Well, one of my T-Rexes. <laughs> my T-Rexes. Did you know Google has a dinosaur at its office? Ten amusing facts about the tech giant. All right, we've... That, that... That's the, that's the Wonkle Rex. I would know this specimen anywhere. I didn't know they had that. What? What? <laughs> Holy cow. You're kidding me. So, you know, long-time paleontologizing viewers are very familiar with this Tyrannosaurus specimen. Golganak knows what's up. Yep, the yes emote that we have here on this channel is the Wonkle Rex. That's the same Tyrannosaurus specimen. And I, yeah, I'd recognize her anywhere. Um... This is the same Tyrannosaurus that we have outside of Museum of the Rockies. It's the same one that I grew up with outside of, uh... Outside of UCMP at Berkeley, the University of California Museum of Paleontology. That's where I, as a baby paleontologist, you know, first kind of... Took my, my first... My first steps in fossil science were at... The University of California Museum of Paleontology. This is that same specimen, you know? Yeah. Uh, and Hogan says, is that the actual specimen or a recreation? This is a cast. The one at Google is a cast. It looks like it's probably cast out of bronze. Um, and they did it quick, too. You can see the juncture there in the tail between the sacrum and the first caudal vertebrae. Um, but yeah, that's really, really cool. I need to go visit this. Although it might be in some sort of a courtyard. Maybe I'd have to... I don't know. Maybe security concerns. But yeah, yeah. This is, uh... This is the Wonko Rex. Holy cow, I did not know that. Um... Who, who said this? Who brought this to my attention? Uh... Let's see... TMKDK. TMK, thank you, thank you. For letting us know about this. 
This is a really, really important Tyrannosaurus specimen. And, uh... I think... Whoop! No, shoot, hang on. Uh... Was it here? No. Nope. Um. Where was this? Well, shoot, I could just find it here. Um. There we go. Oh wait, here we go. I've never seen this video before from Washington Post. Take a look. Yeah. What that contains is the original arm that Kathy Wankel discovered, hmm. um, the maxilla, the upper jaw of the animal, and a lower jaw of the animal. And um, so that's the last one we will actually and Look at that maxilla there with those teeth. So yeah, holy cow. Uh, Pat Legey, Carrie Ansell, like one of the greatest fossil preparators who has ever lived, although she would never admit it. She's far too humble and shy. But Carrie Ansel, holy cow, is a living legend. And Bob Harmon is back here too. Bob Harmon just passed away uh, a few weeks ago. But Bob Harmon, also a legend in dinosaur paleontology. Yeah. I wonder if I show up in this. Uh, I remember them walking around with cameras and stuff, and I actually helped pack up some of these bones at Museum of the Rockies. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Eyes in Washington, that'll be the first crate opened up. I remember this. I was here. Yeah. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> so there is at Museum of the Rockies. Right? This is a bronze cast of the Wonkel Rex outside of Museum of the Rockies. So whoever created this, it might have been Montana Metalworks or another company like that. Google must have uh, must have ordered a copy of it, and there they have it there. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think a human had ever seen a dinosaur those bones before. Said, she, she discovered it. Found a mega find. Everybody says Wankel, but it's Wankel. That is my last name. Yep, Kathy Wankel. It was Wankel. the weekend of 1988. Our family was camped at Fort Peck, which is a, mm -hmm. a dam and a reservoir. We were just looking for pieces of fossils. We never dreamed we'd find the entire thing. They had some fragments in a box. He came out to our station wagon. Took one look, and his eyes got huge. There was only one thing it could be. It, it was the arm of a T-Rex. Yep. In the end, when we got it all prepared, it turned out to be the first complete arm very, of very a cool. T-Rex. <laughs> Went out there June 4th and uh, with a very large crew. And uh, we actually brought it, 1990 now, and brought it back to Bozeman, uh, to the yep. museum, on July 3rd. We've done a lot of research on this specimen. We have determined that it was 18 years old when it died. Yep. It unfortunately died violently. Um, we know that it was probably killed. There's Bob Harmon again. Um, holy cow. <laughs> Remember when I was telling you about Bob Harmon that uh, I was watching a movie, a Hollywood movie, you know, a year or two ago, and uh, one of the characters like seemed really familiar to me. Uh, the movie was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the Tarantino movie. And uh, and one of those characters, it's like, holy cow, he just seems really, really familiar. It's almost like I, it's almost like I know this person. Reminded me of Bob Harmon. It was Brad Pitt's character from that movie. Um, yeah. Uh... <laughs> Brad Pitt's character from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he basically is Bob Harmon. Just same archetype, same, basically same guy, same kind of personality, same, you know, 
He's kind of quiet, but he's somebody who's just an extremely capable person. And like, just, that's Bob Harmon. Anyway, he's the same guy. Um, so anyway, yeah, yeah. Oh, and not the brain has suggested Hyliosaurus, requested Hyliosaurus for Dinosaur Deep Dive. We'll do that right after this discussion. But yeah. Um, and Invisible Dimension says, Danny, I've had a very similar experience. Turned out the writer of the show knew my friend. I saw him through a character. It it happens, Invisible Dimensions. Yeah, yeah. Kind of makes me wonder if Quentin Tarantino ever met Bob Harmon. <laughs> it's not impossible. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it's more an archetype, like, Bob, there, Bob's just like a, a kind of guy, it was a, a kind of guy, is, Bob's memory will live on forever, holy cow, but yeah, yeah. Over all these years, still one of the very best T-Rex skeletons ever found. Oh yeah. The Corps of Engineers owns this fossil, it is owned by the people of the U.S., so it really is the nation's T-Rex. Yep. There's that horse sculpture outside M.O.R. that Deer would always hang out next to. I think something like seven million people. And holy cow, this is, I love this because when I, this is the bronze T-Rex skeleton, the bronze Wonkel Rex cast outside of Museum of the Rockies. And when I was like a freshman and a sophomore at, uh, at Montana State, sometimes late at night, you know, if I couldn't sleep, I would go walk out to the museum grounds and walk from my dorm out there. Uh, through the snow, and I would just go sit down underneath the rib cage of this animal, and I would look up at the stars through its rib cage, and just you know think about what it all means. So this is that's a really really cool shot. This takes me back, you know. So many raids tonight today. Virtual assistant, holy cow! Thank you. For your raid, and welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? Virtual Assistant, I hope you had a wonderful stream. It's great to have you here. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Holy cow. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. And Bro Arl, how are you doing? <laughs> are you calling attention to, the, to my partner badge, Bro Arl? Thank you, thank you for being here. It's, uh, it's good to have you. Yeah. Uh, oh, and Hogan, I think that horse sculpture was made out of metal chains. Here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's made out of old metal chains. An expert in dinosaur studies. And Bazui Nikolsoft, thank you so much for the six months of support. That is six Prime subs right there, and I appreciate that tremendously, Bazui. Thank you for keeping me here on the air for six whole months a long time appreciate you yeah yeah so cool stuff and somebody was asking about the the bronze cast of the tyrannosaurus here um it's hollow but it is totally bronze yeah it's not solid bronze but they must have put it into some sort of rig where they could move it around like that when the bronze was still molten so it's it's hollow but it is bronze so it's very corrosion resistant indeed yeah I think something like 7 million people from around the world will be able to view this dinosaur. You can't help but be proud about that. But Yeah. Um, I'm getting choked up. Oh. <laughs> we thought we'd give her a better one this time. <laughs> After 24 years. So, Jack? So he's presenting Kathy Wonkel with a cast, a resin cast. T-Rex back up, yeah. take him back out to the Dry Creek country where we discovered him. This is a replica. This is not the original. <laughs> yep. There you go. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. That's the Wonkle Rex. And that's the same one that apparently they have outside the headquarters at Google in Mountain View, California. Um, I did not know that. I might have to take a trip down there at some point. That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, very cool indeed. Yeah. And there you go, Hogan. Yeah, that, shoot, that does make a lot of sense. I can imagine that'd be a 
ton of work to weld pieces of chain together. Yeah. Uh, and Eddie Scar insists the Age of Reptiles mural and spelled the let. We'll be talking about that Eddie Scar and yes, and thank you Eddie Scar and for your reminder. You were asking about the about the new movie sixty five that's coming out, and I actually have a uh, a video about that. Just as a um here as a bit of background information. So you can see why this is funny. I'm going to explain the joke before we watch it. I hope that doesn't ruin it. But this is the geologic timescale. This is a really cool international, like, uh, interactive one, rather. The international chronostratigraphic chart. You know, logarithmic, no scaling, linear time. So we are today at the very top, zero million years ago. So this is the present up here. And then 66 million years ago is when the asteroid hit and wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs. 66 million years ago. This new movie with Adam Driver is entitled 65. He crash lands a, a spaceship on Earth, presumably, 65 million years ago. If they're removed, America loses them forever. Thank you, Clicky Jaw, for the Prime sub there. Really appreciate that, Clicky Jaw. Thank you, thank you for supporting Science Outreach here on Twitch. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Holy cow. Um, yeah, anyway, 66 million years ago. We used to think it was 65. You know, if you look at the original Jurassic Park poster. Uh, original poster... You know, what does it say? An adventure 65 million years in the making. Nowadays, we know that it's actually 66. Our dating methods have gotten more precise. We now know the asteroid hit 66 million years ago. So if you were to, if you were to land 65 million years ago, that's a million years too late to see dinosaurs. Except for little birds, maybe. So with that being said... Yeah... Uh, Ace Morph, you're exactly right. 66 now, yes. Uh, here is my little trailer that I put together where I've kind of corrected things a bit and uh, made the, the film trailer for the movie 65 scientifically accurate. Take a look. Charter 373. This is Commander Mills. My ship was hit by an undocumented asteroid. Send help. We've crash landed on an uncharted celestial body. The atmosphere is breathable. There's something alien out there.
So anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, do you get it? So all the dinosaurs except for birds were already extinct by 65 million years ago. The movie title's a million years too late. Thank you, Allie J, for that gift of Schrodinger's Donut. I really appreciate that. So, uh... Shoot. If Adam Driver were to land on Earth 65 million years ago, maybe one of the most fearsome creatures he would encounter, on land at least, would be something like this. A little leptictixid, like leptictidium. You know? That's what I was trying to portray there with the elephant shrews. Um, but yeah, yeah, anyway. <clears throat> Not too late for them to rename it. I think it's far too late for them to rename it. It comes out in like a few days per Scion, doesn't it? When does that movie come out? Somebody look it up. But, uh, anyway. It takes mammals a good while to get big, like several million years to actually get large. After the extinction of the dinosaurs, our little mammalian ancestors started off real small. And they they were real small throughout the whole age of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs kept them small by outcompeting them in larger bodied terrestrial vertebrate niches. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Anywho. Uh, and March 10th, shoot, it comes out in nine days? I'm going to have to see this, aren't I? Oh boy. Um, let's add that to the schedule, I suppose. March 10th is a Friday. Oh boy. Okay. Um, let's see. Sixty-five. Movie discussion. I guess that's scheduled for Monday the 13th. Maybe I'll go see it with Ios or something. Ios likes to go to the movie theater. Um, and maybe we'll go see it together. See, so we'll be here for the aftermath, Jody Fish. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, let me, uh, the luckiest of... Yes, Monday the 13th. Luckiest of Mondays. Welcome, welcome to Clicky Jaw. Don't think I missed your message, Clicky Jaw. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Clicky Jaw says, Hey, Danny and all. I've been watching for a couple of weeks now. Just lurking, lurking. I appreciate everybody who's lurking. You know, not everybody feels like typing in a chat. Although I am glad you, you did finally feel like that. Clicky Jaw, thank you. Uh, I've been watching for a couple of weeks now, and I thought I'd sub. I really appreciate that, Clicky Jaw. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Uh, who remembers Microsoft Dinosaurs CD-ROM? I used to play that CD-ROM loads as a kid in the 90s. I don't think I had that one, uh, Clicky Jaw, but I had another one. Uh, it was called... It's from DK, Dorling Kindersley. Called, uh... Dinosaur Hunter. Uh... And, uh... Here it is here. Yeah, does anybody else remember this? Uh, it was basically like a... A virtual museum that you could walk through. It was really, really cool. I actually still have this. And I have I have it on a disc, and I have an external disc drive. And a Windows 98 virtual machine. We could we could play this one of these days. But basically you walk through and it's a virtual museum. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, they really kind of gussied this up in a weird way, but that's this right here. That's the original Megalosaurus jaw. They they put too many teeth on it. But, yeah. The jaw of Megalosaurus. Here's my 3D printed copy of that. Lilithobo. 
provisions for you and your theater buddy for the emotional damage ahead. Oh, thank you, Lilith Hobo. I appreciate that very, very much. Thank you, thank you, Lilith Hobo. That, that will certainly contribute. Maybe I could buy a popcorn for, uh, for Ios. Entice her to join me, perhaps. But yeah, yeah. 500 bits, thank you, thank you, Lilith Hobo. Really appreciate that support. Anyway, this was exquisite. I remember being just transfixed by this as a kid. And, uh, yeah, the store! They had, like, computer backgrounds and stuff that you could download. And so I remember I had this as my background for a while, all these Deinonychus here, and... Yeah. Yeah, anyway, really good stuff. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. Meganosaurus Joridas, sort of. Sort of, there you go, Golganag, yes, indeed. Yeah. I do think it's funny that they felt like they had to gussy that up. And, uh... Oh, shoot, you can rotate it? Oh, very cool. Yeah. Uh, this is the specimen that it's based off of. I guess they felt like they needed to put more teeth in there to make it less confusing for kids. Uh, but, yeah, here... Uh, you can see some of the teeth growing in. This was the original specimen described by William Buckland back in 1824. We actually did a very special stream on Megalosaurus just, uh, was it last week? Uh, last Monday? Go check it out on the YouTube page. Uh, or in the Twitch VODs. But you can see those new teeth growing in right there and right there. Uh, there's another one right here. And right here, too. Right there. So, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, they... I don't know why they did that, but they decided, oh, it needs more teeth. So they did that here. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Great to have you here, Clicky Jaw. And, uh, welcome, welcome to the channel. And do I know about the National Museum of Wales in the UK? It's our local museum here. We have a real Edmontosaurus skeleton on display. Really? Edmontosaurus is not a Welsh dinosaur. That must have come from... I was going to say either Canada or the U.S., but Canada does not allow the ex the export of dinosaur fossils. That's That probably comes from, uh, from private land here in the U.S. Our dinosaurs being packed up and shipped overseas... Uh, but I'm glad you get to enjoy it there. I'm glad it's in a museum, at least. That's pretty cool, Clicky Jaw. I've dug up some Edmontosaurus bits before. Just bits and pieces. But Edmontosaurus is from, uh... One species of Edmontosaurus, the final one, is from the Hell Creek Formation. And here in the western U.S. Edmontosaurus is actually the biggest dinosaur in the Hell Creek Formation. Uh... It's even bigger than Tyrannosaurus, which is pretty cool. Behold, Edmontosaurus. Named after Edmonton in Canada. Uh, it's a pretty big critter. Uh, the biggest dinosaur in the Hell Creek Formation. So, yeah. Yeah. Pretty neat. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. And one popcorn surely, says the other Caliban. How are you doing, Caliban? Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Eat popcorn while you cry, says Lilithobo. Oh, no. Yeah. And okay, two places. Did the teeth grow back as they wore out? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Most animals replace their teeth all the time as they grow and develop. Mammals, you know, us and our relatives, creatures that feed their young with milk, uh, we don't do that. We only have, like, a couple sets of teeth throughout our whole lives, and then we're done. You know, it's like, sorry, no more teeth for you. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. But most animals, whether they're, you know, uh, I don't know, actinopterygian fishes, reptiles, amphibians, birds, who, birds don't have teeth anymore, but they used to. They would constantly replace their teeth. All the time. Same with dinosaurs, the ancestors of birds. Just new teeth all the time. A dinosaur like Tyrannosaurus would probably go through a whole mouthful of teeth about once a year. 
Just constantly new teeth coming in, old ones being pushed out, like a conveyor belt. So yeah. Ragnarokers here. Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Yeah. And uh Yeah, it was found in North America, is all it says on the website. Probably from a from probably from private land here in, in the US, clicky jaw. Unfortunately, the US is not quite you know, we're not really like a civilized country. Where we have things like healthcare for our citizens. Or sensible laws protecting fossils on private land. So yeah, anyway. Uh consider yourself lucky, Clicky Jaw. And uh it's pretty cool you've got an Anmatosaurus there, you know? Our loss is your gain. Yeah. Anyway. And is eating the bones of animals and having more teeth supply have any ties? Not that I know of Lilithobo, no. It's kind of a non sequitur there, yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, shoot, there's an animal I can think of today that eats bones that doesn't have any teeth at all. Um, uh, let's see... There we go. Yeah. Here is a bearded vulture. And these birds eat bones. It's very, very cool. This is, I think, one of the most beautiful of all modern birds. A bearded vulture. There's something about them. They're just gorgeous. So they will, they specialize in eating bone marrow. So they'll pick up bones, and then they'll drop them from the sky onto rocks. The bones crack open, and then they go and they swallow the fragments. And, uh, yep, there you go. You see it drop it? Yeah. Fedorasaur. Thank you, Fedorasaur, for those 17 months of support. Really, really appreciate that. Holy cow. Yeah. Uh, really, really neat. Fedora, sir, thank you so much for the 17 months. That means a lot to me. Minutes, they were finding fossils. And Mean Eyed Cat, thank you for that follow. Great to have you here. Holy cow. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a modern animal that eats bones. It's got no teeth at all. Vultures. No teeth. Just like all modern birds. No teeth. Except for a few mutant chickens here and there. But yeah, uh, osteoporosis eats your bones in a different way. It typically doesn't drop them <laughs> from very substantial heights on rocks. But yeah, Darian Beagle, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Ragnarokker says, on a scale of one to absolutely how inaccurate is Zeb? The Dominion Giganotosaurus. Seb the Do I don't know what you're talking about, Ragnarokker. Oh, the, the Jurassic World Giganotosaurus? Oh, boy. It's not great. It's really not great. I don't know. It's not terrible. It's not as bad as their Baryonyx. Which would be... Their Baryonyx is just... Dog water. Just absolutely embarrassing. Bottom of the barrel. It's the the leakage underneath the barrel that's leaked out of the bottom. That's what their baryonyx is. Giganotosaurus is somewhere near the It's in it's still inside the barrel, but it, it hasn't quite reached the floor of the barrel. It's anyway. The Jurassic World Giganotosaurus is not great. It's really not. Uh, is this a Giganotosaurus or a Giganotosaurus? I've always said Giganotosaurus. Some people say, uh, Giganotosaurus. I think I remember, uh, paleontologist, uh, Luis Giappe saying, uh, Giganotosaurio, Giganotosaurus. That's what it was. <laughs> that was, uh, that was actually like one of our, one of our catchphrases. 
when I was in the field last summer just goofing around with other paleontologists. You know, we're there and we're working in the quarry and then one of us would like just kind of perk up and look at everybody and go, Giganotosaurus. <laughs> I think I got that from Ethan. But anyway, yeah. Giganotosaurus, Giganotosaurus, or Giganotosaurus. Um, tomato potato, you know? It doesn't really matter how you say it. As long as people know what you're talking about, it really doesn't matter that much. I'm not going to go, well, actually, it's pronounced this way. Yeah. You know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and the community named it Zeb. Short for Zebulon? What? Oh. Uh, you know, maybe it's just my... My kind of scientific upbringing at Museum of the Rockies, but, like... I kind of recoil anytime anybody insists on giving a dinosaur specimen a nickname. That's something that I associate with, like, commercial specimens... And people trying to sell a dinosaur to the highest bidder. It's like, oh, you have to give it a name. Because it'll get more money that way. It's like, ugh. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. Something about that. It's just... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, when I learned that... Apparently, like, Jurassic World fans... Have, have all collectively decided that the... That, like, a, a Tyrannosaurus in the Jurassic Park series or Jurassic World series should be nicknamed Rexy? Like, I... Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Something about that, though, just, like... It gets my heckles up, you know? Like, I don't know. I don't like it. I don't like it. Uh... Yeah, it's pronounced Jif, says Schrodinger's Donut. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Because it has a zebra-like pattern. It wasn't black and white. What are you talking about? Are Jurassic World fans colorblind? I would have called it spiky or something. Because it was like... It looked like a Todd Marshall illustration. It was so spiky and spiny. Uh, Giganotosaurus. Yeah, nothing about this says zebra to me. <laughs> I look at this and I don't think, oh yeah, a zebra. <laughs> I don't get that. <laughs> I really don't. Um, I don't know. Nothing about this says zebra to me. If anything, I look at this and I think it looks very... It's got these big iguana spines right here. What do you call it? Iggy? Or, or spiny, spiky, spike. Spike would be a good one, you know? I don't know. It's, it's just very, like, rough and pebbly and spiky and spiny. Um, yeah, but nothing about this says zebra to me. Gotta be honest, you know? Spike's, <laughs> Spike 980 says, hey, wait a minute. Welcome, Spike. Hey, no offense mean, meant to you. Welcome, welcome, Spike, to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. I don't recognize that name. Is it your first time here? Welcome, welcome. It's great to have you. Yeah. Uh, and I would prefer to call the 93 Rex Roberta. Much more original. Yeah, there you go. Like, Rexy sounds like a name that somebody would make up if they're trying to make fun of, like, Jurassic World fans. Like, oh, let's call it Rexy. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it feels like infantilized somehow. Um, but yeah, yeah. And Spike says, I love watching your streams, man. I'm always lurking, but rarely talk. Well, I appreciate you. Again, shout out to any lurkers who are watching. And lurking, I appreciate you more than I can say. It's great to have you here, Spike. Um, thanks for finally saying hello. Seriously, that means a lot to me. I'm trying to to grow this channel, trying to to bring in new folks and expand our our mission of science outreach to the far corners of the internet. That's why I started posting all the vods to YouTube recently. 
Um, so if you're not yet following there, I guess they call it subscribing on YouTube. That's funny. Subscribing means something totally different on YouTube than it means on Twitch. On Twitch, it means contributing financially to the broadcast. On YouTube, it just means following, you know? They really ought to change that. But they're probably in too deep to do that at this point. But, uh... Yeah, anywho. Um... Yeah, go follow on the, uh... The old YouTubes, you know? Uh... Is that the... There we go. There's the command. Yeah. Uh... It's the stripey pattern on his back, says Ragnarokker. Yeah. And there you go, Ragnarok, Roberta. I like that. I mean, she is supposed to be female, right? Like, B.D. Wong's character says, you know, uh, all the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park are female. We've engineered them that way. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, which is funny, because still in actual dinosaur paleontology... It's extraordinarily difficult, like almost impossible, to tell a male di dinosaur from a female dinosaur. And so far, we only actually have proof of female dinosaurs. There's a few Tyrannosaurus and Tenontosaurus specimens that we can tell were female because they were pregnant. They were about to lay eggs. They've got medullary bone inside their femurs. Um, so far, we don't have any proof of any male dinosaurs. No conclusive proof. So, yeah. So... That's life imitating art. All dinosaurs are female as far as we can tell so far. You know, I'm mostly joking, but... You know, honestly, we, do, we don't have any proof of any male dinosaurs at this point. You know? So yeah. Yeah. History buff. How are you doing, history buff? Welcome, welcome. So that's really interesting about the female male discoveries. I'll show you a clip about that real quick before we get into our main topic today. Uh, there we go. Let's see. Yeah. So this is talking about the B-Rex specimen, the oldest, as far as I know, the oldest Tyrannosaurus specimen ever dug up. This is from uh, my old museum that I used to work for, Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. There's my old boss, Jack Horner, that you're going to see in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> I feel like we need to pause here just to let that sink in. So Mary Schweitzer is in the business of, well, in the, in the science of molecular paleontology. She looks at the interior of fossil bone, looking for things like biomolecules, even potentially DNA, although we've never found any DNA from any Mesozoic dinosaurs so far. Turns out DNA is probably way too fragile for that kind of thing. It doesn't last 66 plus million years. But uh, anyway, she was able to just look at these fragments of Tyrannosaurus bone from the interior of the femur, because again, they had to break the femur in half to get the helicopter to lift it. It was too big, too heavy. So it seems like a tragedy, you know, to uh, to break that apart. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Holy cow.
which is really funny. Like, <laughs> I love this little exchange right here. So Leslie Stahl, the journalist from CBS, she says, identify gender in a dinosaur, which, strictly speaking, is completely wrong. Dinosaurs didn't have gender. Gender is a human construct. It's not really all that much to even do with biological sex. Mary Schweitzer says to sex a dinosaur, determine the sex, if it's male or female. Um, yeah, and we can determine that B-Rex was female from these fragments. So far, we still don't have any. There's, I suppose, a slim chance that maybe all dinosaurs were female because we still don't have, you know, 100% proof that any dinosaurs were male. The only absolutely proof, absolute proof that we have of any dinosaur sex is that dinosaurs were, a couple of dinosaurs were female. So anyway, but yeah. The first piece I pulled out, I picked yeah. it and I looked at it, and I said, it's a girl and it's pregnant. Yeah. That's the first time, as I understand it, that anyone had ever been able to identify gender yeah. in any dinosaur. Yeah. Mary recognized a specific type of bone called medullary bone, which female birds produce when they're about to lay eggs. Yep. No one had ever found it before in a dinosaur. It was yet another link to birds, and it meant that B. rex was definitely no bob. So she calls yeah. you up and she says, she calls up and says, <gasps> we have <laughs> oh. now, this there you go, Skolgan, maybe. Yeah, that is very exciting. And that wasn't all. Yeah. So if you want to see the rest of this, here is the link. You can bookmark this or open it in a new tab. But holy cow, is this an awesome, awesome report on, uh, yeah, on uh, my old, you know, museum, Museum of the Rockies and my old boss, Jack Horner. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh anyway. And Clicky Jaw says, could it be possible that the males were a completely different animal? Or we just or would we have found them by we would have found them by now, Clicky Jaw, yeah. Yeah. And Bobby with an eye. There you go, Jody Fish. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Although Bob, that's named after B Rex. You know uh, it's named after Bob Harmon. But you know that Jody Fish, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh and let's see. And uh, there you go, Ragnarokker. Yeah, I I get that part. Life finds a way, after all, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and hidden. Gender on a dinosaur. Well, not gender. Sex on a dinosaur. Gender is a human thing, hidden. But welcome, welcome, hidden. It's good to have you here. Welcome to paleontologizing. Good to have you. Now, shoot. Let's finally get to our... Our topic that we came here to discuss today. Uh, oh, well, no, we can't quite do that yet. Shoot. First, I got to do a dinosaur deep dive on Hyliosaurus for Not the Brain. Brain, are you still here? Or Not the Brain, are you still here? I hope you are. Not the Brain has suggested only the third dinosaur ever scientifically described. One of the original three, Hyliosaurus. Not the brain. Glad you're still here. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Surely birds too would be the same? Or like certain species of fish? Birds too would be the... I don't know what you mean, Nell. What? I'm, I don't follow, Nell. Could you re clear Could you rephrase your question? And, uh... <laughs> And History Buff says, what's the difference between sex and gender? So gender is like a human thing. It's like in human society, you know. But biological sex is different, and it can be determined in different organisms in different ways. So like in uh, mammals, in most mammals at least, I don't know if it's all mammals. Mammals have sex chromosomes, so it's XX or XY. But sometimes you get XXY, and like... A lot of people are born intersex, um, where they've got two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome. Like, I've known some people like this. It's not as uncommon as you might imagine. Um, but, like, as humans, we tend to... Just kind of because society is typically pretty rigid about this kind of thing, we often take people and we either put them into one gender or the other. You know? So someone who is intersex, they've got two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome. 
we might assign them male or assign them female. You know? That's what gender is. Gender is like the societal thing that we put on top of it. It's not scientific. Gender is not a science term. But biological sex is. Um, and it's a lot squishier than, like, gender, you know? Gender is like a box that we put people in. But biological sex is something that happens in biology. Uh, birds, for instance, have... What is it? It's ZW and ZY or something like that? The bird sex chromosomes are different from in mammals. And in fishes, fishes are really interesting that they can actually... You know, a lot of fishes can change their biological sex as they grow and develop. So, like, uh... Sheephead fish are a good example of this. Um, let's see. Uh, so they actually change sex uh, throughout their lives, which is pretty neat. Here we go. This is more common than you might expect in nature. Yeah, cool stuff. The California sheephead wrasse is a protogenous hermaphrodite. This means huh. that all individuals are born as females and yep. transition to males later in life. Sheepheads can be found in the temperate waters of the eastern Pacific Ocean, off the coast of Southern California and, you, and Baja California. You got it, history buff, yeah. Inhabit kelp forests and rocky reefs from 15 to 165. So that's a male, I think. And curious nature makes them a popular target for spear fishers. Oh no! Individuals will mature as females at four years of age and change sex at around 31 centimeters in length and eight years of age. There you go. So if you see a male sheephead with the big bulbous forehead like that, that means that he. I get. We're talking about fish, so he, she, it, whatever. This fish was female up until about eight years of age and then transitioned into being male and having male uh, reproductive gear, which is pretty cool. Can vary. Yeah. Populations with higher survival rates have been observed to reach larger sizes before sex change. Sex change occurs in the winter months. Very cool. So anyway, yeah, nature is really complicated and interesting when it comes to this kind of thing, and it's really fascinating, you know? Yeah. So trying to put, like, you know, rigid, you know, gender on animals doesn't make any sense. Gender is like a human thing. That's a societal construct. Nature is far more messy, complicated, and honestly, much more interesting than that. So that's my perspective as a scientist, and I, I hope it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, if a dinosaur fossil were found discovered deep in a glacier, asked Clicky Jaw, could it preserve the tissues for ice long enough? Clicky Jaw, unfortunately, there are no, none, zero glaciers that go back to the age of dinosaurs. So, yeah. Uh, basically, zero chance of that. Uh, ice doesn't actually last that long. Um, there's no ice on Earth that's more than a few million years old. Probably a few hundred thousand years old, honestly. Let alone 66 plus million years, you know? So yeah, yeah. With the world of moved, adapted, ice melted too much. You got it, Clicky Jaw, you got it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So yeah, uh, none of the ice on Earth is that old, unfortunately. Man, would that be cool to find a, a whole, a whole frozen Mesozoic dinosaur? It doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh. And Ice Allen says, "Is that giant bug from the Jurassic era, Jurassic period, found by an Arkansas Walmart real? It seems crazy. That is it fossilized, or I'm gonna need more information, Ice Allen." <laughs> But it's good to see you, Ice Island. I hope you're doing well. Yeah. 
Uh, and Clicky Jaw? Yeah. You, see, you were right on the money there, Clicky Jaw. Yeah. It's in the news. Can't believe it. Can you send me a link, Ice Allen? Let's take a look at this, because I haven't heard about it. Uh, but Caliban says it was a species that disappeared around the 1950s, and now they found it in a place that it didn't used to be in. Can I link? Uh, moderators, can you make sure that Caliban can link? I, I don't know how the controls work on this, but thank you, Caliban. Let's take a look at that. Uh, huge Jurassic era bug. So already we're off to a bad start. So the Jurassic is not an era. The Jurassic period is a period. So yeah, yeah. Here we are in the present, in the Cenozoic era, the Quaternary period of the Cenozoic era. Let's go back 66 million years ago, the asteroid hits Earth. Beyond that is the Mesozoic era, the age of the dinosaurs. And here's the Jurassic period from about 201 million years ago up until 145 million years ago is the Jurassic period. So it goes super eon, uh, eon, era, period. And so the Jurassic is a period, not an eon or era. Yeah. Jurassic era bug. Oh, boy. Also, bug is not a very scientific term either. But yeah. Super rare discovery. Yeah. Uh, it, it's probably the case that this author here, hardworking journalist, she almost certainly did not write this headline. Usually it's the editor who writes the headline. And usually editors, in my experience... Don't know hardly nothing. So, yeah. Not fake news, Ice Allen, but let's take a look. I'm sure whatever this is, is going to be fascinating. So let's let's dig deep and let's find it. Scientists are unraveling a mystery that may have never seen the light of day, if not for a fateful encounter over 10 years ago outside of Walmart in Arkansas. That's when Michael Skvarla, and that name sounds very familiar to me. I want to say I follow him on Twitter, actually. Director of Penn State's Insect Identification Lab came across an astonishingly large flying insect while shopping for groceries. He says, I remember it vividly because I was walking into Walmart to get milk, and I saw this huge insect on the side of the building, says Kavarla. I was working on its PhD at the University of Arkansas at the time. I thought it looked interesting, so I put my hand I put in my hand and did the rest of my shopping with it between my fingers. Oh, he put it into his hand. <laughs> So here he is walking around Walmart, buying stuff, and he's got a big dragonfly in his hand? I got home, mounted it. Mounted it, that means, you know, you stick a pin in it. You know, uh... Mounted insect specimens. You know, like this. You've seen these before. That's what he means there. Yeah. Mounted it and promptly forgot about it for almost a decade. At the time, Scavarla didn't know that the insect he so casually held in his fingers was a living artifact. Well, it's not living anymore. Uh, what he thought was an antlion, a bug that resembles a dragonfly, was actually a giant lacewing. Giant lacewings were abundant during the time of the dinosaurs, but they mysteriously died out in eastern North America over a century ago. Over half a century ago. Oh, boy. So there's a bit of a bait and switch going on here. So, giant lace wings. Yeah, lace wings are these buggos. Yeah, they're fairly... To use a term I don't like very much, fairly primitive insects. But yeah. Yeah, they're not actually... This is not from the Jurassic period. You know? Uh, or the Jurassic Era. Uh-uh. No. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. The last giant weight lacewing recorded in the area was found in the 1950s. But this is the first species to be found in Arkansas. Uh, this discovery suggests there may be a relic population of this large Jurassic Era insect yet to be discovered. 
Oh, the actual press release from Penn State says Jurassic era? Oh, no. Come on, scientists. Do better. Yeah. Uh... So it's not the journalist's fault. Whoever in the in the press office for Penn State University really botched this, you know? This is lousy. So anyway, uh here, if you want to get the full story, here's a link. Ivy League indeed, you know? Ivy League, you know? <laughs> uh, the press offices for stuff like this can be really frustrating. I remember, so I, uh, when I was a student at Montana State University, uh, I remember my colleagues complaining about the press office at Montana State, where there's some sort of official policy at the university where if you publish new research... They encourage you, or maybe even require you, to first send it to the university press office so they can send it to news agencies and stuff and try and, like, get some attention for it. But according to everybody I ever talked about, uh, ever talked with who, uh, who went through this process, they're like, yeah, the press office completely botches it. Like, they'll take your research and then they'll, like... Purposefully change a bunch of things about it to get it completely wrong. And then they'll send it to news agencies who are not going to cover it at all. And so, like, I remember Denver Fowler talking about this. And he's like, yeah, I, I'm i just sending out the press releases myself. And he did a much, much better job than the, than the people who were, like, paid full time to do this. You know? Those people would just butcher all of the science. And then they would send it to the wrong people so it wouldn't actually get covered. And I kind of suspect that that's what's going on nationwide in American universities, is the press office just does not know what they're doing. You know? And uh, clearly that's what happened here. Well, they at least sent it out so it got covered, so that's good. But Jurassic Era is wrong. And... Yeah. Anyway. Makes sense, yeah. Skullgun says, but why? It's bureaucracy, you know? These are people who are not necessary, who were hired as bureaucrats by an ever-increasing bureaucracy in a university system, and they're trying to justify their jobs, so they require everybody to send them the press releases so they can butcher them, and then... It's the story of the American higher education system of the past... Since Reagan, basically, you know? The American higher education system has been just on this, yeah, elevator to heck. Just go going down. Uh, professors, especially adjunct professors, you know, are being gotten rid of. Tenure track positions are disappearing. The administration at each of these universities is ballooning tremendously. And those people are gobbling up all of the money. And the people who actually do the real work, the real research, the real teaching, the real science, they're increasingly feeling like volunteer positions. You know? So anyway, yeah, don't get me started on any of that. But the American higher education system is dying. It is dying. And I feel very, very fortunate to have been able to have escaped that system. And now I stream on Twitch five days a week. And I am incredibly happy to be able to do this. It's so much more fulfilling than being in the academic rat race. And, you know, trying to claw my way towards tenure or something. Oh, boy. So, yeah. Yeah. And not just in the sciences, says Caravan. See, Caravan knows. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the 80s rot spreads and entrenches. Golganak is clued into this, too. Golganak knows what's up. Yeah. Escape is the correct word. Z Black Rider. Yeah. I wish it weren't like this. I'd love to see a, a renaissance in uh, 
American higher education. But uh, things are being increasing, increasingly commercialized, bureaucratized. You know, administrators are the people who are well paid at universities now. The people who are seeing pay raises and seeing more and more jobs. They continue to get rid of professors and adjuncts. And yeah, it's increasingly difficult to make a living as, say, a scientist at a university. I have friends who, you know, back when I was at Montana State, I had a, a scratch that. Back at an unnamed university, uh, uh, in a video game in Minecraft, not actionable. Oh, uh, one of my roommates was uh, uh, was a master student, and uh, and uh, I'm trying to remember this. I might get some of the details wrong, but anyway, he uh, I think he was somebody's master student, and then that professor like just kind of disappeared. And my roommate had continued on his project and everything, and the the department was trying to figure out, like, well, shoot, what do we do with him? His advisor is gone now. Like, we'll pass him off to this other guy. Uh, really, really hardworking researcher would be his new advisor. But this advisor was non-tenure track. He was an adjunct professor. He wasn't supposed to have master's students or PhD students. But my roommate, the department told him, oh yeah, we're going to take your master's project. We'll make that a PhD. And now you're this guy's student. Well, this guy's an adjunct. He's getting paid like $12,000 a year to teach several classes and, you know, write tons and tons of grants, grant applications all the time and everything. He spends the majority of his time writing grant applications and he's making significantly less than minimum wage. And this... This adjunct professor, he's got a postdoc from an Ivy League university. You know, very prestigious. He produces tremendous research, just really, really extraordinary. And he's getting paid like $12,000 a year. Not in a tenure track job. He's got to do all of the work of a tenure track professor, having students and everything, getting paid $12,000 a year. He would make twice as much maybe working at McDonald's, you know? Yeah, that's hard work working at McDonald's, but this guy works really hard too. So anyway, yeah, so my, my roommate, my friend, he, he's a PhD student of an adjunct professor, which is like, that's not supposed to happen. That's like the me meaning of adjunct is you don't have students. So anyway... This sort of thing is increasingly common in American universities, and uh, the whole system is just rotting from the inside out. And uh, uh, I'm incredibly lucky to have been able to have escaped from that. And I am tremendously grateful to everyone who's helped me do that through your support here. So thank you, thank you. You rescued me. So thank you for that. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Ah, but yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah, and don't get me started on the coaches, Jody Fish, oh boy, almost without, without fail, the highest paid person on a university campus is not a professor, not somebody doing groundbreaking research, changing the world through, uh, you know, newfound knowledge, new discoveries, it's not a museum person, it's not somebody working in the field it's it's a football coach or in some cases a basketball coach those are almost without without fail the highest paid person not just at the university but in an entire state here in the u.s is usually a football coach a head football coach they make like multiple millions of dollars per year the whole thing's a racket there was a good book that came out years and years and years ago i think it was back in the 90s called beer and circus about the decay of the American university system. Just check it out. Beer and circus. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, welfare would treat you better, says Z Black Rider. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, well, I don't know. What welfare do we have here in the U.S.? Let's be honest. 
Oh, uh, but yeah. yeah. Anyway. You'd probably make more money with a cardboard sign, you know, by a busy intersection than you would as an adjunct professor at a lot of universities. I knew people who lived in their cars. You know, adjunct professors who, like, they couldn't afford rent. They literally lived in their cars. And then they have to clean themselves up and, and teach students five days a week. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Z Black Rider says, lol, okay, I'm in Canada. Yeah, in the, here in the States, it's... You have no idea, Z Black Rider. You have no idea. Consider yourself lucky. Uh... And Clicky Jaw says, when you think about Twitch, it's pretty great. You have 100 to 200 viewers every weekday. How many times were you talking to 200 people in a room every day in academia? Because right now that's what you're doing. It's You're right, Clicky Jaw. You're right. And that is... Thank you for putting that in a perspective for me. I appreciate it, Clicky Jaw. Yeah. You're 100% right. So, yeah. Yeah. And you're in Canada, too? Consider yourself lucky, Amelia Bedelia. Holy cow. Yeah. I, I know so many friends and colleagues who had to, to leave science. Because it just... It doesn't pay anything here in the States. You know? They couldn't make a living. You know, we, as scientists, we're people who are... Who are there on the, on the cutting edge of human knowledge. You know? We're trying to make new discoveries... In my field, teach the world about about the amazing history of life on our planet. And we're getting paid the equivalent of like $3 an hour sometimes, if we're lucky. If you can even find a job as an adjunct professor. You know, you might be working 50, 60 hours a week and making like $12,000 a year. So yeah. Yeah. Caravan says there are classes with 200 people in it, and that's not a great way to teach. I had a class with over 900 people in it. Uh, I didn't have to teach it. I was a student in that one. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's not great either. It's really, really not. Um, anyway, you check out that book. I wonder if it's... I used... I need to get, an, get myself another copy of this. Uh... Oh, here we go. I'm going to grab a copy of that right here. Hardcover. Add to cart. Proceed to checkout. Uh, wait, where's my cart? Hang on a minute. Yeah. Beautiful. Proceed to check out, and then I'll show you this book. I don't want anybody to scoop it up before I get it. <laughs> ah. Yeah. But here we go. This is written back in the 90s or early 2000s, I think. Uh, there we go. Uh, Beer and Circus, how big-time college sports is crippling undergraduate education. There's a link. If you're curious about this, if you want to really depress yourself, read that book. Um, yeah, by Murray Sperber. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, uh... And Hogan says, I'm often upset about the anti-intellectualism of American society. Especially when I hear about people with PhDs that get paid poverty wages. Oh, holy cow. Another friend of mine, uh, she got a job, well... She and her husband moved to a different state. They're both, both PhDs, brilliant researchers, brilliant paleontologists. She moved... Uh, she quit her job as a museum director in another state, which she moved across the country for. Her and her husband were, like, living several states apart. Then she quit that job and moved with him when he got a job 
at a museum. And she was getting paid to work at a, like, local college. She was getting paid $900 per semester to teach, I think, two classes. She's a PhD researcher, the former director of a dinosaur museum. It's wild out there. You know? It's wild. It's... She was, like, happy to have that job, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. That's why I'm so happy to be here. Holy cow. Um. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh. And there you go, uh, Jody Fish. Wait, hang on. Jody Fish. That was my freshman English professor. Uh, at IU. You mean, uh... Yeah, anyway. Uh... And Wheelbase, has ever seen the map of highest paid state employee by state? It's always football coaches, except for Minnesota. Is it the governor for Minnesota? <laughs> Oh no, who is it for Minnesota, Wheelbase? You, that's... You, who is it for Minnesota? You can't leave us on a cliffhanger like that. The director of the medical school. Oh. Does Minnesota, does, uh, does U of M have a really prestigious medical school? Because that would make a lot of sense. And, uh, Jesse Ventura, he was the governor of Minnesota. <laughs> yeah! He was also the guy with the slouch hat from uh, from the movie Predator. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> <I laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not dissing him. No, not at all. Not at all. I ain't got time to bleed. There you go, Clicky Jaw. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Yeah. Oh. Uh, he, he had the mini gun. The, he had, like, the Gatling gun. <laughs> there he is on the left next to Arnold. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, he wasn't a terrible governor from what I understand. I don't know. Um, there have definitely been worse governors in U.S. states. I can tell you that. Yeah. He's got a hat kind of like mine that I have in the field. His might be felt. But mine's a... Uh, a leather Australian slouch hat. Also known as a digger hat. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> uh. Anyway, enough of this goofiness. We're two hours into the stream. We've not even talked about Rudolph Zellinger's Age of Reptiles mural yet. Let's get on topic here, you know? Yeah. And I'm sure he wasn't great, Hogan, but he's not the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Danny for, for governing to... Hello. Golgenek, thank you. Um I wouldn't want that job though. Uh maybe for a year. I don't know. Hmm. And Rupa Creations. There's always new stuff popping up on the shelves here, Rupa. Yeah. Welcome, welcome to back to Paleontologizing, Rupa. Great to have you here. You notice our juvenile Tyrannosaurus here? It's got a different pose. Yeah. Uh, Golganek actually provided these wonderful acrylic rods right here. So we could remount it. So thank you, Golganek. And then we've got a baby Triceratops skeleton right here. Who still needs... There's some missing ribs and some uh, transverse processes on the vertebrae here. And the end of the tail is also missing. Covered up by this protoceratops skull. 
And the cervical ribs are missing too. But anyway, it's all a work in progress. Constantly changing. You know? So yeah. Yeah. And roses and tea, that is a lamp. That's made out of a pufferfish, which is an invasive species throughout much of its modern range. Uh, that's a pufferfish lamp. And uh, I actually bought that for a friend of mine. And then she moved away from California before I could give it to her. She really loved pufferfish. She had some sort of a nickname. It's like pufferfish derived. I bought that for in like Haight Ashbury here in San Francisco. And, uh,. Yeah, I never had a chance to give it to her. So now it's here in my office. So yeah. Yeah. Uh Danny has no cats. Yeah, Z Black Rider. No no permanent cats. We had some temporary cats last week, but they went home. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. A puffer fish lamp? Exactly, Golkanak. Yeah, a puffer fish lamp. You know what I mean? Uh it's made of a real puffer fish. You know, it looks like this. Yeah. Or like that. Uh, you'll... They're common in tiki bars. If you've ever been to a tiki bar, you've probably seen these before. They're pretty common, uh... Pieces of, uh... Decor in places like that. So, yeah, sounds cool, says Rose and Tea. Thanks. It smelled really bad when I got it. it smelled like formaldehyde. <laughs> and I don't know what else. Formaldehyde and death. But I used a lot of Febreze, let it air out for a long time, and now I now I don't smell it at all anymore. So, yeah. Trader Vix, Lilith Hobo knows. Trader Vix in Emeryville, right? I'm particularly fond of uh, Forbidden Island in Alameda. Uh, yeah, favorite tiki bar in Alameda, California, and you can see there's actually a puff, a couple of pufferfish lamps, lamps right there. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Uh. Yeah, Forbidden Island. My favorite tiki bar, local at least, it's right here in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and there's a pufferfish lamp right there. It's kind of hard to see, but that's on a very tame night. Holy cow. Anyway, I'm a sucker for a good tiki bar. Yeah. And you're building a tiki bar. Very nice, Z Black Rider. Look on eBay. You'll find some good pufferfish lamps, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. With that being said, holy moly, let's finally get to the topic at hand here. Uh, let's talk about Rudolf Zellinger's Age of Reptiles mural. Which is the subject for today's stream, although you'd never know it, based on how many rabbit holes we've gone down. But, uh... Yeah. Here is my tweet from earlier about this. With a little video. We actually saw this when we were talking about Deinonychus. Let's hear... John Ostrom talk about this mural. I'd like to introduce you to the largest painting in the world. <laughs> it portrays time over a span of about 350 million years. Yeah. From the Devonian period. Oh, shoot. We did forget your dinosaur deep dive, not the brain. Let's do that real quick, and then we'll get into Zalinger's mural. <coughs> not the brain. Let's talk about Hyliosaurus. Man, our discussion has been so rollicking today that, uh... Yeah. It's it's so easy to get distracted. Uh But give me a second here. I once did an illustration of Hyliosaurus for a t-shirt 
And I'll see if we can find it here, maybe. Uh, portfolio PDF. It might be in here. Uh, don't, maybe not. But Hyliosaurus is one of the original three dinosaurs first named. When the word dinosaur was coined, way back in 1842, there were three dinosaurs that were part of that. Uh, so let me see if I can find that for you real quick. Let's see. <laughs> this is not what we're talking about, but here is... Holy cow. There's me in the governor of Montana. Back in 2015, there's Governor Steve Bullock, the Democratic governor of Montana. Back before Montana had a, like, bug-eyed creationist as its governor. Uh, we talked about dinosaurs for a few minutes, but there's Steve Bullock there. Um, at the Made in Montana trade show in 2015. That was, uh, that was a ton of fun. So I've never met the governor of Minnesota, but I've met the governor of Montana back when I lived in that state. And, uh, here we're talking about dinosaurs. So, yeah. Uh, and back then... <laughs> Ragnarokker, my goodness. Back then, I only had a beard when I was in the field. I would grow out a beard every summer when I was out digging dinosaurs. Then when I got back to civilization, I would promptly shave it off. Now I guess I've gone fully feral and I've got a beard 24-7, 365 now. Uh, but yeah, anyway, let me see if I can find this image with the original three dinosaurs. Where was this? I'm digging through old hard drives from old computers. Is it in here? Portfolio images? No. Uh, shoot. Ah! Let's see. I had an old folder that was called completed images. I think what I have to do is dig through... I'm going to do this manually. Uh, desktop, digital art, finished images. Uh, origami Tenontosaurus. Nope. This is one of my, like, very, very first images that I ever did on a t-shirt. Back when I still worked with Cafe Press. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. Shoot. It might be lost to time, but it featured a Hyliosaurus. Uh, let's see. Let's search original and see if it comes up. It might be lost forever. Um... Sorry, everybody. Nope. Not going to come up. Anyway, Hyliosaurus is an ankylosaur. A polycanthine ankylosaur. Only the third dinosaur ever scientifically described. And one of the original three dinosaurs to be included within Dinosauria. Which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah... So the original fossil material of Hyliosaurus looked, well, shoot, there's a lovely illustration there. Back in the 1850s, with only very limited material, it was thought to look like this. Basically a big quadrupedal lizard-like animal, although with upright limbs like that, like an elephant. It was thought to look like a pine coney kind of lizard in between the 1860s and 1920s. And today... Armored tank. Well, it's a polycanthian ankylosaur. With everything that that, that that entails. Here, you can still see this. Oh. You can still see this to this very day. 
at Crystal Palace Park outside of London. This is a model of Hyliosaurus. Built, uh, completed in 1854. You can still see this to this day. Nowadays, with more fossil specimens that have been dug up, we realize the animal would have looked a lot more like this. It's an armored dinosaur, an ankylosaur. And there is the original specimen, or rather a cast of it, from Tilgate Forest in Sussex and jolly old England. Oh, yeah. Hyliosaurus. Lived about 136 million years ago in the late Valanginian stage of the early Cretaceous period of England. It was found in, found in the Grinstead Claim Formation, which is a stub. Holy cow. Not a lot of stuff from there, apparently. Yeah. And there is the holotype. This is all that they really had when they were trying to figure out what this animal looked like. So, of course, they thought it looked like some sort of big spiny lizard. This is all they have to work with. Nobody really knew what a dinosaur looked like at the time. So, there you go. Yeah. Uh, oh, and you were once there in person. Very cool, Paleo Stream. Very, very cool. I've never gotten to visit Sydenham Park, so that's really cool. Yeah. And you went to school in East Grinstead. Very neat, Jeb Doctor. Well, this dinosaur is from not too far from where you went to school. Is Tilgate Forest anywhere near there? So there's an illustration of the holotype specimen there from 1868. So yeah, Hyliosaurus. You know, Megalosaurus and Iguanodon get all of the attention when we talk about the original three dinosaurs that were dug up. Or scientifically described, at least. Um, yeah. <sighs> Hyliosaurus really does not get nearly enough attention. And with that said, I don't really know all that much about it. I know it's a Polycanthian Ankylosaur. Yeah, it was one of the first three dinosaurs Richard Owen based the Dinosauria on, with the others being Iguanodon and Megalosaurus. We'll be talking more about Iguanodon later on in this broadcast, as we talk about Godzilla, actually. I did not misspeak. You heard that right? Uh... Yeah, only limited remains have been found of Hyliosaurus, and much of its anatomy is unknown. It might have been a basal notosaurid, although a recent cladistic analysis recovers it as a basal ankylosaurid. Really? I thought it was a polycanthane. Interesting. I wonder what Jim would have to say about this. Jim Kirkland, who I'm working on some ankylosaur stuff with right now, actually. Uh... Jim is an ankylosaur expert. I wonder what he would have to say about Hyliosaurus. He'd probably have an interesting take on this critter. So the first Hyliosaurus fossils were discovered in the Grinstead Clay Formation in West Sussex. On the 20th of July, 1832, fossil collector Gideon Mantell wrote to Professor Benjamin Sillyman that when a gunpowder explosion had demolished a rock quarry face in Tilgate Forest, several of the boulders freed... Uh, showed the bones of a saurian. Saurian means, you know, a reptile. A reptile. A local fossil dealer had assembled about 50 pieces, described by him as a great consarn of bits and bones. <laughs> you gotta love antique English. Having doubts about the value of the fragments, Mantell had nevertheless purchased the pieces and soon discovered they could be united into a single skeleton partially articulated. Mantell was delighted by the find because previous specimens of Megalosaurus and Iguanodon had consisted of single bone elements. The discovery, in fact, represented the most complete non-avian dinosaur skeleton known at the time. He was strongly inclined to describe the find as belonging to the latter genus, so he thought it was part of Iguanodon. But during a visit by William Clift, the curator of the Royal Colleges of Surgeons in England Museum, and his assistant, John Edward Gray, he began to doubt the identification. Clift was the first to point out that several plates and spikes are probably part of the armor, body armor, attached to the back or sides of the rump. In November of 1832, Mantell decided to create a new generic name, Hyliosaurus. It is derived from the Greek Hyleos of the wood, 
Mantel originally claimed that Hylaeosaurus meant forest lizard after the Tilgrate Forest in which it was discovered. Later, he claimed it, that it meant wielded lizard. Wielden being another word for forest. Is that right? And you go back this far into dinosaur paleontology and everything gets all mixed up. Yeah. Anyway, very, very cool. There is the Crystal Palace model built by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, completed in 1854. You can still see this to this very day. That's what they thought Hyliosaurus looked like at the time. But nowadays... We think it would have looked something like... Let's see here. Oh, that's beautiful. That's a head-on image of Hyliosaurus. Something kind of like this. We still don't know what kind of ankylosaur it really is. But, uh... It's something interesting. For certain. There you go. There's a plastic model of Hyliosaurus with a person for scale. Really neat animal. Yeah. Uh, someday, hopefully, somebody will find something more of this critter and we'll be able to figure out what it actually looked like. But for now, our best approximations are... Well, shoot, this is really as good as any, I suppose. Right there. <laughs> ah, yeah. Hyliosaurus. Something kind of like this. An ankylosaur. Although, I would love to see this critter with some, like, more... I don't know. Some kind of warning coloration on it. You know, I like my dinosaurs with, uh... With bright colors. Dinosaurs had full color vision. Just like modern birds. That's where birds got their color vision from. And Bob Nichols coin spotted. There you go, Paley's Dream. Yes, indeed. That collectible coin that I showed earlier? Yeah. I think this might be a Raul Martin illustration here. It looks like his style. He's done a lot of work with National Geographic. Uh, I don't know. If you're an animal with this kind of defensive armor... Camouflage probably isn't your number one concern. You know, you would have been a large, not particularly graceful, pretty conspicuous animal. Hiding from predators probably isn't at the top of your list. So having something like warning coloration would make a lot more sense for this critter, you know? So I, I really like Saurian's Ankylosaurus for this reason. You know, this, I think they they really got this right. What do you think of this Paleo stream? You, I'm sure, uh... I'm sure you would have some opinions on this, right? I really like this. It's kind of modeled after, like, a, a Mexican beaded lizard or a Gila monster. You know, these bright yellow colors saying, like, Hey, stay away from me. I will mess you up. Don't come close. I will break your bones. You know? This is kind of how I picture ankylosaurs. I, I really like this. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, if anybody is not yet following Paleostream, who's in chat right now, make sure you do so. Uh, Paleostream says, I love Saurian's Anki design. Very effective and not too bright. Works really well. Yeah. I think this is excellent. Uh, there we go. Go follow Paleostrom, who is a working paleo artist himself. He does phenomenal work. And he streams here on Twitch. Paleostrom, I've got to respond to your uh, your Twitter message. I did get that today. I got it just as I was getting ready to, to start streaming. Streaming an hour early today. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh... Very stumpy legs, though. I mean, that's correct for this animal. These guys are very wide and stout. You know? They're like, uh... They're like a station wagon. You know? Which works to their advantage. If they had longer egg, le longer legs, 
they'd be easier to push over, and then you could just eat their soft underbelly. Instead, they're very low slung, low to the ground, heavy, wide, difficult to turn over. It's one of their keys to success. So yeah. And we still have some time? Thanks, Paleostream. Good. I gotta think about what I would want to talk about. Shoot. I've got a couple of conferences coming up. Maybe I could talk about one of those research topics, but we'll see. We'll see. And there you go, Caliban. Yeah, low center of gravity to swing that heavy tail. And yeah, this massive club on the end. I love the coloration on the club. Just gorgeous. Really nice. So yeah, this is actually in a video game called Saurian. So, uh... Yeah. One of these days, I'll play this again. But yeah. Anywho. And Paleostream says, one of the best Ankylosaur models just dropped... What is this? Ooh. Ho, ho, ho. Paleostream, thank you so much. Holy cow. Check this out. That is exquisite. Of course, it's from... Is this Korean? It looks like Korean. Uh. Look at that. So is this... Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Is this Talarurus? Or is it Cychania? Or Pinecosaurus? It's going to be one of these Asian Ankylosaurs. Probably a Mongolian Ankylosaur. Almost certainly a Mongolian Ankylosaur. Uh, Tarchia. That's it. Okay, Tarchia. Yeah. Very, very nice. Tarchia. A Mongolian Ankylosaur. Mongolia has the best preserved ankylosaurs anywhere, with the possible exception of China. But China's ankylosaurs tend to be small. That's actually what I'm working on with Jim Kirkland. Liaoningosaurus. But, uh... Yeah. Beautiful. And this gives you a good sense for how wide these animals are. Tarchi of the table, yeah. It's like a giant, heavy, armored coffee table. With a huge club on the end of it that could, you know, sever your spine if it hits you in the right place. Break your shins. Crack your skull open. Thank you. This is a wonderful addition, Paleostream. This is really lovely. I like that so much. Uh, Very, very cool. Here, this deserves a follow. I don't speak Korean, but... Hang on a minute. Uh, it won't let me translate? Well, shoot. Oh, there we go. A reconstruction model and skeleton made of Tarchia, a Mongolian armored dinosaur. Pili artist Jingyom Kim. This is the work of the boss. Thank you for the wonderful gift. Exquisite. So beautiful. This is really, really nice. Yeah. Four on the floor stability. There you go, Golganek. Yes, indeed. And Paleo Stream, yeah. Stay tuned for some Liao Ningasaurus paleo ecological changes, we'll say. Holy cow, there's like a hundred specimens of that animal. Somebody needs to re describe it. But uh, we've got some paleo ecological revisions to make. I'll, I'll just say that. But yeah. Yeah. And Smorphosaurus, hey, I'll see you next time. You get some rest. I'll see you soon. Yeah. And hey, give me just a second, and I'll show you the uh, the Alvarosaur I was working on yesterday. Yeah. 400 specimens around. It might even be more, Paleostream, yeah. Jim was telling me about this. He's like, they've got an insane number of individuals of Leonangosaurus. Uh, yeah, like a huge mass death assemblage of these animals. Um, so yeah, it's going to be exciting, Paleo Stream. It's going to be exciting. But, uh, before we get into that here, let's pull this up. 
I am by no means a professional artist or anything, but I was working on a model of an Alvarasaur yesterday on stream. And I made some, uh, some modifications to it after the end of yesterday's stream. And here's what I've got so far. This is Trirarchuncus prairiensis. The very last of the Alvarasaurs. I started putting feathers on last night. And I'm still working on my feathering technique. I, uh... But yeah, so, so far it's just on the tail and the base of the neck. But this is a dinosaur that uh, I'm an author on. From July of 2020 in the journal Cretaceous Research. Trirarchuncus prairiensis, the last of the Alvarezsaurs. And, uh... Yeah, after I'm done feathering this, I'll put it into a nice pose, and then I'll print it out with bronze color filament, or copper color filament, and it'll replace our Victorian Iguanodon that we have right there. Because while that's really, really cool to have, I'd prefer to have a more modern dinosaur reproduction on my shelf, because people come in and ask about that, and... And I always have to go, oh, well, this is a Victorian perception of what Iguanodon would look like. Our model of this animal from today is, you know, our modern perception is much different. It's a nice discussion starter, but it's like, it's not going to be as cool as saying, hey, here's a dinosaur that, uh, that I helped bring to light, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And hey, Britt, how you doing? Welcome, welcome, Creatrix Britt. Can we get a shout out for uh, for Brit here, real quick? Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm still working on this, and I wanted to overemphasize the claws. This is the last of the Alvarezsaurs, just before the asteroid hit. I wanted to really, you know, kind of go Cope's rule with this, make it big, make those claws really exaggerated, so it's the most ridiculous member of its lineage, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, uh, and looks good with feathers. Thank you. I'm still working on, I, I'm learning how to sculpt feathers, but my goal with this is to be able to print it and make it look kind of like, uh, You know, kind of like this or something like that. You know? Have a very... A, a nice kind of bronzish sculpture there on my shelf. You know, something like this. You know, this is an animal with a similar kind of silhouette. Something like that. Should look very classy. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and what did I sculpt this in? In Sculptress, Brett? Yeah. Nope, hang on. There we go. Yeah. You can s Google Sculptress. Really simple freeware program. It's really old at this point. This program's got to be like 15 years old or something. No longer supported, but it's the best beginner sculpting software around. It's a shame the company killed it. It's it's really, really good. Yeah. Hmm. Uh. Reminds you of Gigan, Gianmi? Another time, another time. We're going to be dealing with Triarchuncus a lot as I get closer to printing that. We, we got to start talking about our topic for the day. Yeah. To the end of the dinosaur era, the end... So again, here is paleontologist John Ostrom talking about our subject for today, which we are, I can't believe it, we're just now getting to this. This is nuts. But here we go. And I use a draw pad, Britt. Yeah. Yeah. Here. I'd like to introduce you to the largest painting yeah. in the world. It portrays time over a span of about 350 million years. Yeah. Devonian period back in the Paleozoic, all the way up to the end of the dinosaur era, the end of the Mesozoic. Yep. All the age of reptiles. 
And by the way, I love how John Ostrom says reptiles. It's like, it's an accent that you don't hear anymore. This, it's almost a mid-Atlantic, like, you know, East Coast, American, well-educated kind of accent. Like, oh, yes, the age of reptiles. Reptiles. You know, I, as a West Coast, you know, crass, working-class American, say reptile. But, you know, John Ostrom says, said reptiles. The age of reptiles. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Here is the old picture of dinosaurs. Pea-brained giants lumbering through lush tropical foliage, gorging themselves on leaves and grass. For years, the stereotype was magnificently represented by this mural. Yep. Since the 40s, when it was painted, a number of discoveries have been made, and new ideas have been thrown into the debate. And this is very, very true. Holy cow. Our picture of dinosaurs has just advanced by light years since this was first painted between 1942 and 1947. It was on this very day, in fact, in 1942, that Rudolf Zallinger, old Ru Rudy Zallinger, was, was hired by the Yale Peabody Museum to paint some murals for the hall on this very day in 1942. That's why we're talking about this today. Uh, but yeah, in the time since, our picture of dinosaurs has advanced tremendously, and a good part of that is thanks, originally, to John Ostrom, as he's kind of bragging here, but, you know, he deserves it. Let's listen this to him. been thrown into the debate, and perhaps one of the most important discoveries was made by me. <laughs> He's talking about Deinonychus, whom we talked about on Friday. So yeah, yeah, good stuff. Um, this is my tweet from earlier. Up. Oh, now you go back down that ladder. There we go. Uh, but yeah, yeah, and holy cow, twenty nine likes, not not too shabby. Uh, trying to bring new people in. Good stuff. So yeah. Uh, and it's a fresco. Yes, it's a fresco seco paleo stream. We'll be talking about that. Yeah. So this is a, a technique painting directly onto plaster, not onto canvas, but direct onto the plaster facade inside the building. Or wall. It's, I guess a facade implies that it's outside directly onto the plaster interior of the building using egg tempura paint. This is a technique that was common in the 14th and 15th centuries. And we'll be talking more about that in a little video in just a minute here. But uh, good old Italian stuff. Yes, indeed, Gian me. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know what? Let's... Why don't we get into one of those videos right here? Shoot, we're already behind schedule. So without further ado, let's go ahead and do that. As soon as this loads, Google servers are really chugging along right now. There we go. Yeah. Uh, like John Ostrom was saying, that is one of the world's largest paintings. Or at least it was at the time. 110 feet long, 34 meters long! 34 meters. One painting. It took almost five years to complete. From 1942 until 1947. Let's talk about the creation of this fresco right here. Here is a lovely video. Really, really well done. You're in for a treat. This is exquisite stuff. Here we go. Yeah, creating the Age of Reptiles. Morgan, museum instructor and artist at the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. It's a yeah. pleasure to be able to talk to you about Rudolf Salinger and the creation of the Age of Reptiles mural. Rudy was an artist I admired for many years and eventually got to know while working at the Peabody. This is a photograph of the Peabody's Great Hall as it looks today. And here is a photograph of the Great Hall taken in the 1930s before the and it looks so empty. Look at that. In the 1930s. 
blank wall right here. It's just crying out for some kind of illumination here, some kind of, you know, artistry to help fill this blank space. This is the horizon which marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. Below this level, and out in here, there are dinosaur fossils. Above this level, on these rocks, there are no dinosaur fossils. So I'm actually standing on the level that marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. Akira Direwolf, thank you so much. And then nine raiders have stumbled below that level. Let's talk dinosaurs. Let's talk dinosaurs and deer. Akira Direwolf, thank you, thank you for the raid. How are you all doing? Welcome. It's a paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Direwolf, like... Well, the taxon formerly known as Canis Dyrus, that Pleistocene uh, dire wolf. Now I think it's what, Erisiron? Erision Dyrus? Anyway, welcome, welcome. You've got a fossil critter's name and your username? It sounds like you're in the right place. Welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. And, uh, yeah, I dig up dinosaurs across the American West with different museums. I study dinosaurs. I publish on them. And nowadays, I talk about dinosaurs five days a week right here on Twitch. So if you've got questions, I'm here for them. Don't be shy. We are discussing on this day... Rudolf Zellinger's famous mural... The Age of Reptiles. Uh, even if you don't think you're familiar with this, you probably are, or you have seen its influence in some way. Remarkably influential painting. And Rudolf Zellinger, the uh, Russian-Austrian-American painter from the mid-20th century, he was hired by the Yale Peabody Museum on this very day, March 1st, 1942, to create art for the Peabody Museum, which resulted in this. So we're celebrating that anniversary today. If there is a, like, Sistine Chapel of vertebrate paleontology, you better believe this is it. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of art. So anyway, Lucidity Waves, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing, Lucidity. Thanks for saying hello. And Poison Chowder. Poison Chowder, thank you for the follow, and welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you? Yeah! Good stuff. It is a gorgeous mural, Caliban. It really, really is. Yeah. And Chowder? You got it, Chowder. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. In fact, I feel like in this case, we, uh, this might be a good opportunity to change our streaming category from science and technology to la art. Art. Nope, not, not that. Art. Art. Because we're talking about paleo art here. Let's do it. Yeah. And you were going to say something like that, considering Michelangelo's fresco? There you go, Invisible Dimensions. Yeah. <laughs> Sistine Chapel, eat your heart out. Uh, This. This is where it's at. Yeah. Uh... One of the most extraordinary pieces of art that I know and extremely influential. Here, just to start us off. Here is a quote. There are numerous dinosaur paleontologists who have credited this mural with inspiring them to begin a career in dinosaur paleontology. And one of them is paleontologist Peter Dodson. Um... Dodson. Dodson. We've got Dodson here. Paleontologist. P 
Peter Dodson. Yeah. Uh. And uh, this is from David David Rains Wallace's excellent book, Beasts of Eden, which we'll talk about toward the end of the stream, too. This is actually inspired by Real Love Zellinger's Age of Mammals mural. But at the very beginning, there's uh, a little bit about the Age of Reptiles mural, which is obviously much, much better known. And uh, so here's Peter Dodson quoted here. He says, I was moved nearly to tears by the Zallinger fresco and the Great Hall when I visited there as a Callow College senior. One dinosaur scientist, Peter Dodson, wrote in 1999, This portrayal of the history of 350 million years of life on land is familiar to every paleontologist and to every reader of natural history books. One of the high watermarks of natural history illustration in the 20th century. Another dinosaur scientist, Robert Bacher, traced his vocation to seeing the picture in a Life magazine article at his grandfather's house in 1955. And uh, I happen to have a copy of that September 7th, 1953 issue of Life magazine right here in my office. Here we go. Uh, my girlfriend in college actually purchased this for me as a birthday present years ago. But there it is right there. Just absolutely exquisite. We don't have Life magazine anymore, but this used to be the premier periodical here in the U.S., And, uh, I really wish my camera would focus properly on it here. Let's see if we can fix that. Mm. Turn off autofocus. Let's do this manually. There we go. Two billion years of evolution. Life magazine. And there is Zellinger's Brontosaurus. Apatosaurus. No. Brontosaurus. And Stegosaurus there. Yeah, September 7th, 1953. 20 cents it cost at the time. Uh, yeah. And in this are some full, like, full color reproductions of Zellinger's work. Holy cow. Yeah. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Dinosaurs are kind of funny. Hannibal Rising, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Put this here for now. So yeah. Uh, and how are you doing, Cadmos? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And Iwix Art says the artist in me just squeaked. There you go. This is a stream today about the importance of paleo art and how incredibly influential it can be. So yeah, yeah. And Hannibal Rising says, Hi, I love dinosaurs. My friend just showed me your channel. Hannibal Rising? It's great to have you here. Welcome, welcome. Sounds like you're in the right place. Yeah. We're talking all about Rudolph Zallinger's mural, The Age of Reptiles, today. And, uh... I guess let's start over this little video about that. And I can show you... A little bit of background on its creation and why it's so important. There we go. Hello, I'm Armand Morgan, museum instructor. Caravan says, fun fact, Rilof Zellinger's wife, Jean, was a children's book artist. His three children are also artists, talented family. You'll see his wife show up in this video, at least in a piece of his art, actually. Cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, I'm Armand Morgan, museum instructor and artist at the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. It's a pleasure for me to be able to talk to you about Rudolf Salinger and the creation of the Age of Reptiles mural. Rudy was an artist I admired for many years and eventually got to know while working at the Peabody. This is a photograph of the Peabody's great hall as it looks today. Not today today. This video came out, when was this? Uh, 11 years ago? Holy cow. So this is what it looked like 11 years ago. I think the hall might still be under renovation today in 2023. I don't think it's reopened yet. 
Although, please correct me if I'm wrong about that. I, I don't... I, I'm a West Coast guy. I don't... Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't live on the East Coast, nor do I go to Yale. But, uh... But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway. And here is a photograph of the Great Hall taken in the 1930s uh, before the creation of the mural. Yep. You may have noticed that several of the mounted skeletons have moved since then and that the ceiling uh -huh. has skylights. In 1941, the director of the museum, Albert Parr, wanted to add a series of small paintings on the east wall. And holy cow, Hannibal Rising? What's wrong with our alerts? There we go. If they're removed, America loses them forever. Hannibal Rising, thank you for supporting science outreach and education here on Twitch. I really appreciate that. I know you only get one Prime per month. Thanks for spending it here. I really appreciate that. You're contributing to our sub goal there. We're now one quarter of the way there. Thanks to your Prime. Thank you very much, Hannibal. I appreciate you. Yeah. Let's continue. Museum, Albert Parr wanted to add a series of small paintings on the east wall. These paintings would depict what some of the skeletons below might have looked like when they were alive. So here's, here's the museum director here, and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, this place is looking a little bit staid and stolid. There's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of white space here. Why don't we gussy it up with some paintings? Little did he know what he was getting himself into. Holy cow. Ah, yeah. Yeah. These paintings would depict what some of the skeletons below might have looked like when they were alive. Yeah. Lewis York and our professor at the Yale School of Fine Arts suggested huh. that one of his most gifted students, a senior named Rudy Zallinger, would be up to the task. So <laughs> He's so young right there. Holy cow. In March of 1942, Rudy was hired to create the small paintings. So that's why we're doing this stream today. March 1st, 1942 is when Rudy Zallinger was hired. And here we are. So in March of 1942, yeah. he to create the small paintings, but soon he proposed a much grander and more architecturally fitting project. Rudy envisioned a giant mural on the entire wall that would yeah. function the panoramic timeline. Uh. This enormous undertaking would be completed as a fresco secco, or dry fresco, a painting technique used during the 14th and 15th centuries. Here is a preliminary Very sketch of Rudy's cool. mural proposal Holy for cow. the onlooker to provide a sense of scale. Rudy and his wife, artist Jean Zallinger, and two children are illustrated on the far left. So there they are right there. I love that he puts himself and his wife and their two kids in for scale right here. <laughs> a whole family of artists used as a scale bar in concept art for one of the greatest pieces of art you know, ever produced on the American continent. Uh, really extraordinary. It is interesting that the children were strictly imaginary at the time this was drawn. Oh. For it would be another two years before Rudy and Jean started a family. <laughs> so, so he could see into the future as well as the past. Ah, <laughs> uh, very, very cool. Yeah, probably the original walk back in time image. I think it very well might have been Paley's Dream. Either this or maybe some of the work that Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins did in New Jersey for Princeton back in the 1800s. But that never really took off in the same way that this did. Holy cow. I mean, this art right here would be featured in postage stamps and Life magazine and all kinds of stuff like that. So here is a U.S. postage stamp from the 1970s featuring this art. Six cents for a stamp back then. What are they, 52 cents now? But yeah, tremendous cultural impact. Tremendous. Uh, and, uh, yeah. After receiving the director's approval to pursue the much larger mural project, Rudy began working with scientific advisors from Yale and Harvard to create an accurate portrayal of roughly 300 million years of animal and plant evolution, including the rise and fall of the dinosaur. Hang on. I love these other, <laughs> these other figures he put here for scale. Is this supposed to be a man and a woman right here? This is like a married couple. The man is like rail thin and the woman is quite rotund. The man clearly had a sense of humor. Uh, I really like that. 
I like that a lot. <laughs> Evolution, including the uh, dinosaurs. Yeah. After six months of intensive scientific training and numerous revisions, Rudy completed this nearly seven foot long preparatory drawing in pencil. <laughs> there you go, Jody Fish, yeah. To divide the mural into the various periods of geologic time. Beautiful. Following the way that medieval frescoes were created, Rudy spent nearly a year on his next step, a complete but much smaller painting of the mural in egg tempera. Oh, so maybe the final was not done in egg tempera? I'm not sure. Anyway, but this is what we call the model right here. And funny enough, this is what actually appears in Life magazine. So... The technology did not exist in the 1950s to photograph this huge 34 meter long mural for Life magazine. So instead, what they photographed was his model that he created here. And so most of the stuff that you see reproduced and like there are I had a poster of this, you know, six feet long, almost two meters long in my apartment in Bozeman, Montana where I lived with three other paleontologists. We had this running down the hallway that led to the bathroom. Um, yeah, and that's based on the model right here. It's not based on the actual fresco that's at the Yale Peabody Museum. There's subtle differences, and I'll teach you some of those as we continue to discuss this, you know? Yeah, there's only one book with the original, says Paleo Stream. Which book is that? I would love to know. It's got to be a pretty recent book, right? I would imagine. Let's continue. Egg tempera was the primary medium for painters in 14th century Italy before huh. oils were widely used. This stage of the mural process is called the model. The model. Egg tempera painting involves mixing pigments with egg yolk and water and then applying the mixture to a wooden panel. Huh. While the egg tempera model was nearing completion, the east wall of the Great Hall is prepared with several coats of plaster. Hmm. Using charcoal, Rudy drew a grid on the plaster wall to help transfer and enlarge the composition of the finished model. Very nice. Rudy later reported that only when he first began to draw on the 110 foot long wall with this tiny piece of charcoal, did he feel any trepidation about the whole project. <laughs> I mean, holy cow. This is a project that would have taken him almost five years. I mean, imagine being an artist and looking at this huge facade like this and going, I've got to fill all of that. With my art? I've got to climb up on this big scaffold and do that? I mean, I mean, I would be excited about that, but it also might, it must be a really, really daunting thing to look at. I mean, holy cow. And uh, Paleostream says this one. Well, what is this? Uh, very nice. Yeah, July 2010. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I need to get the, oh man. Maybe not available in, uh, oh, Amazon dot, Amazon dot DE. Of course, Paleostream hails from Deutschland. Let's see if I can get it here. $18. Spiral bound. Uh, read more. There's information here, right? Second edition of the Peabody's Guide to the Zellinger's Masterwork is a compilation of earlier material and new information. Oh, holy cow. I'm putting this on my wish list right now. Uh, there it is. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> um. Yeah. Thank you, Paleostream. That looks really, really cool. Uh, extraordinary. And it's really funny, just looking at that, I can tell this is a different Tyrannosaurus than, uh, than the one from the Life magazine. Like, it, there's just, there's subtle differences here. The teeth look different. The eye looks different. The silhouette of the body is just distinctly different. You know, I've seen these images so many times that it's like when you're a, a cashier. You know, like, I used to work as a cashier years ago. And after a while, you know, when somebody hands you a counterfeit bill, like a fake piece of paper money, once you've seen enough of this sort of thing, 
you don't quite know why you can tell the difference, but you can spot the difference between a real one and a fake one. You just have this image in your head, and it... It's the same kind of thing here, where it might be very subtle. But holy cow, this is... Yeah, that's the original right there. That's not... Or that's the... That's the fresco. That's not the model. Yeah, holy cow. Uh... Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you, PaleoStream. Appreciate you. Yeah. And Tipper ND, I'm so glad you got a gift sub. You deserve it, Tipper ND. Welcome back. It's good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Uh, let's get back to our, uh, our video here. Glad we started this now. We're, um, we'd be behind schedule if we didn't. Did he feel yeah. any trepidation about the whole project? In this photo, you can also see the old and incorrect Apatosaurus skull that was eventually replaced with the correct one 38 years later. Yeah, there's the old... I was going to say it's a Camarasaurus-style skull, but it's not really based on anything. They just kind of, like, made this up. It doesn't even look like a dinosaur skull. Like, where the fenestre? It... Oh, boy. Yeah, they're like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Here's a Camarasaurus skull by comparison. Camarasaurus made up. Uh, oh, Yale, my goodness. Uh, it's Gertie's lame cousin. There you go, Cadmus. Yeah, yeah. They tried their best. Okay, says Bertrand. Then on. Yeah, I, I want to say that the museum in Pittsburgh had a, a decent Camaras, a uh, decent Apatosaurus skull at the time, and Yale was like, "They're like, oh no, we're gonna, we're gonna do things differently." Oh yeah, that's a reptile head. There you go, Triceratops. Uh. <laughs> Rudy is standing on the six foot wide skull uh. erected at the bottom of the mural, sixteen feet below the ceiling. He is clearly drawing the outline of all the plants and animals, but he hasn't added any details yet. Very, very cool. We're going to watch another video in a few minutes from, you know, much more recent time from the actual, like, restoration of, uh, no, cleaning. I don't, they don't really restore it, but they're cleaning it at the Yale Peabody Museum. So they've built scaffolding there again, and the, one of the, uh, the conservators at the museum is going to walk us through it, and we'll actually get to see the mural up close which is really cool. You'll get a really good sense of scale here. Yeah. After finishing the outline, Rudy applied a monochrome underpainting using burnt umber and black pigments yeah. mixed with a solution of casein glue instead of egg yolks as the binding medium. Oh, interesting. So in the, the final product, instead of egg yolks, casein glue. Cool. Yeah. This photo shows the finished underpainting which Rudy Look at that! Sometime in the early part of 1944. Gorgeous. That's a work, a work of art in and of itself. Lights, so that when the next layers of color were added, some shading from underneath would show through. Beautiful. This photo was taken in October of 1946 when the painting was close to being completed. That is gorgeous. I mean, just this. I aspire to do work that is half as good as this. I really like the. It almost reminds me of, like, in a comic book or something like that, where you've got fairly flat colors like this, but you've got very exaggerated shadows uh, to kind of emphasize the outlines of these different critters. This is gorgeous, and... Oh, it's so nice. It's so nice. But if you look carefully at the plants and dinosaurs just behind Rudy, you can see the painting looks rather flat. In a really cool way. It looks very, like, graphic design -y. Oh, excuse me. Uh... I really like it that way too, Gianmi. Yeah, it's really nice. Really nice. Just behind Rudy, you can see the painting looks rather flat. Yeah. The underpainting appears to only have a single layer of color over it. Hmm. Finally, Rudy would add the darkest shadows, the brightest highlights, and other details, such as hundreds of scales on each dinosaur. Very cool. Rudy Look at that. The mural in June of 1947. Two years later, his work on this magnificent project was recognized with the Pulitzer Scholarship Award. In 1953, this image of the Apatosaurus was featured on the cover of Life magazine when they began a 13-part series on the history of life called The World We Live In. 
<laughs> Beautiful. Known to many, the Apatosaurus yeah. egg was taken from the egg temper model, not mm -hmm. the mural itself, which was too large and technically difficult to photograph in the 1950s. What I tell you. The image was also reversed so that when the entire painting was reproduced yep. inside the magazine, it could be read from left to right, unlike Rudy's timeline, which runs from right to left. And so Ru Rudolf Salinger made it go from uh, uh, from right to left at the time because as you would walk into the hall, he wanted you to start off at the oldest time in the Devonian. And then he would continue up through time, get closer and closer to the present, and then that hall led into the, the hall of the Age of Mammals. And then he had another mural in there, much shorter, only about 60 feet long. And that mural is actually the subject of this book right here, um, which if anybody's interested in ancient mammals, I would recommend this book, Beasts of Eden. I just reread this for the first time in like well over a decade. I just finished rereading this a little while ago and uh, it's really, really good. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, you know, as you can tell looking at my office, I don't, I don't really work on mammals. So this was a really nice kind of refresher for me on uh, the history and significance of our mammalian friends of the Cenozoic. And Mesozoic too, but, you know, Mesozoic mammals. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, only 60 feet long. Yeah, there you go, Caliban. Yeah. And which sauropod would be the last time? Zombie. Com I don't know, Cosmos. We're not really talking about that right now. We're talking about this. So yeah, forgive me, Cosmos, for not going off on a big tangent right now about zombie sauropods or whatever. Um, let's continue. It was also reversed so that when the entire painting was reproduced inside the uh, it could be read from left to right, unlike Rudy's timeline, which runs from right to left. Yeah. Although the egg temper model and the mural look nearly identical at first glance, there are several changes that Rudy made when he moved to the much larger painting on the wall. Oh yeah, example, and which makes perfect sense. You know, shoot, if you're if you made a model, you know, like a schematic of an illust of a painting like this, and then you work on the final painting for five years, you're definitely going to make some changes along the way. I mean, you're working on this thing for five years, a half decade. So yeah, you better believe he's going to make some changes there. Yeah. Left. Although the egg temper model and the mural look nearly identical at first glance, there are several changes that Rudy made when he moved to the much larger painting on the wall. For example, when painting the final mural, the larger size allowed Rudy to add much more detail to the landscape. Oh yeah. Here is a scene from the Jurassic section of the model compared to the same scene in the mural. Another difference is this Archaeopteryx, brighter yeah. than the egg temper model, but not as brilliant in the mural. So, you know, maybe it's because I've seen the model so many times. It's just like burned into my brain forever. I grew up with this. It was in just about every, you know, it was in a ton of books that I had growing up and I had posters and you know, I remember one time my my dad went on a, a business trip when I was a kid. I was probably eight or nine years old. And uh, he went on a business trip and he was able to visit. He had like a really long layover. Maybe his flight got delayed or something like that at Denver International Airport. And so he took a taxi cab probably into downtown Denver and he, he visited the Museum of Natural History. Looked around at that for a little bit. And he got me a couple of things from the gift shop, you know? We didn't grow up with a lot of money, so it's nothing expensive. But he got me a little postcard of a, uh, a Utah Raptor from Walking with Dinosaurs. And he got me a little magnet of the Age of Reptiles mural that they had there in the gift shop. And I probably still have it to this day. I'd have to root around a little bit, but yeah, it was about this long. Little ruler, magnetic ruler, six inches long, and it had the whole Age of Reptiles mural right there. And uh, it was printed in like really good detail, uh, really, really high res, very high 
DPI, dots per inch. And, uh, you know, this was one of my prized possessions when I was a kid. I'd never really been to a proper dinosaur museum growing up. And so to have this brought to me by my father from when he got to visit one was really, really cool. And, uh, anyway, yeah. But I remember the brightly colored Archaeopteryx. Because, again, that picture was taken from the model right here, not from the full mural. And so to me, this is what I'm used to. I'm used to this. This looks weird. So this is the model, which is the one that gets popularized. This is the actual full-scale one, you know? So yeah, yeah. From the Jurassic section of the model compared to the same scene in the mural. Yeah. Holy cow. DJ K-pop girl. <laughs> DJ K-pop girl. Welcome, welcome. Has a new sound for their four listeners. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. How was your stream? I hope it was really, really good. And welcome, welcome. DJ Raid indeed. Hope you had a fantastic stream, DJ K-pop girl. Welcome to Paleontologizing. If anybody's new here, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You know already that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular, hence dinosaur paleontologist. It's great to have you here. So glad you could join us. We are today talking about Rudolf Zallinger's Age of Reptiles mural. Here we go. At Yale's Peabody Museum. I'd like to introduce you to the largest painting in the world. Yeah. It portrays time over a span of about 350 million years. From the Devonian period back in the yep. Paleozoic, all the way up to the end of the Dinosaur era, the end of the Mesozoic. Sistine Chapel, eat your heart out. This had tremendous influence over the depiction of dinosaurs in pop culture. Yeah. It's the old picture of dinosaurs, pea-brained giants lumbering through lush tropical foliage. Pretty old-fashioned. Yeah. In leaves and grass. For years, the stereotype was magnificently represented by this mural. Yep. Since the 40s, when it was painted, a 1942 is when it started. And new ideas have been thrown into the debate. Into the debate. So yeah, this was first started, or rather, Rudolf Zallinger, the artist, was first hired on this very day, March 1st, 1942. The painting would take five years to complete. But it started on today, or actually, he was hired on today in 1942. Who knows when he actually started work on the, the fresco itself. But yeah, and he filled it well with critters. He did indeed, Ice Allen. So yeah, uh, this is not the artist. This is John Ostrom, who was curator of paleontology at the Yale Peabody Museum back in the 1970s. And uh, he's about to brag about a really important discovery that he made. <laughs> Yeah. Years, the stereotype was magnificently represented by this mural. Yeah. Since the 40s, when it was painted, a number of discoveries have been made, and new ideas have been thrown into the debate. Yep. And perhaps one of the most important discoveries was made by me. <laughs> He's talking about Deinonychus, who we did a whole live stream on last Friday. So check out the VOD for that. But uh, we're talking about this mural today. The Age of Reptiles fresco. So here we go. Yeah. When painting the final mural, the larger size allowed Rudy to add much more detail to the landscape. Yep. Here is a this is what I'm used to. Section of the model. Yep. Compared to the same scene in the mural. Yowza. Another difference is this Archaeopteryx, brightly colored in the egg temper model, but not as brilliant in the mural. Yeah, which 
a small but he's actually onto something because now we we have some idea of what archaeopteryx may have been colored like and it, it probably looked kind of like a crow you know uh we've got a feather of archaeopteryx where we could actually figure out what colors it was and it was black or very very dark blue um so anyway archaeopteryx probably was kind of drab but i still like the uh Another yeah, I still like the bright colors. Brightly yeah. colored in the egg temper model, but not as brilliant in the mural. Yeah. A small but interesting detail is that in the model, there is a leaf falling in midair from the Apatosaurus mouth huh. that Rudy decided to leave out of the mural. Huh. This is also a clue that the Life magazine cover and all older posters were taken from the egg temper painting, not yep. the actual mural. <clears throat> yes, indeed. Although mammals are known to have existed since the late Triassic period, Rudy did not include any in the model. And that's interesting. Hang on a minute. Did you catch that, chat? Here. Let's go back. You ready? Very close attention. See if you can figure out what I'm zeroing in on here. Not the actual mural. Okay. Although mammals are known to have existed since the late Triassic period. Interesting. <laughs> Our captions here are differing from what was said there. Yeah. Here. Watch. Watch. Although mammals are known to have existed since the late Triassic period. So the narrator said late Triassic period. Captions say early Jurassic period. So I wonder. There's some kind of a disconnect here. I know because I upload videos to YouTube. You know, check out the, the YouTube channel. Uh, yeah. But you can actually upload a... Uh, a subtitles file separately from your video. So I'm guessing what they did here is they wrote out the script and they had all of that text there. And then uh, in filming the video, I bet you the narrator had a second thought about this and he's like, let me look this up. How how late do... This is a dinosaur. And this is a dinosaur too. V.I. Peritos. Bienvenidos a Paleontologizing. V.I. Peritos. Welcome, welcome. It's great to have you here. Gracias por seguirme. How are you doing? ¿Qué pasa? It's great to have you here. VI Peritos TV. Welcome, welcome. Let me know if you've got any questions. Uh, but yeah, shoot. I bet you that the uh, when they were making this video, the narrator decided to like, let me double check on this. And he realized, that, no, shoot, mammals actually go back to the late Triassic. And so he recorded it correctly, but then when they were uploading the script here, uh, they used the earlier text in it. That's really funny. Yeah. So yeah, I think the earliest mammals that we have are late Triassic, or are they early Jurassic? Anyway, what is a mammal? What's a true mammal? I'm not a paleomammologist, you know? I'm not a mammal guy. But yeah. So the captions are scripted, but there was a verbal correction given. It might be, Gimplag. It might be. It's a very minor thing. I was about to say, I'd love to know the full story there, but it's so minor that, like... Yeah. But again, here we go. ...were taken from the egg temper painting, not the actual mural. Yeah. Although mammals are known to have existed since the late Triassic period... Hmm. He did not include any in the model and <laughs> added only one to the mural, a Simoleskis, just to the right of his signature. Yeah, which is cool. He's like, yeah, I'm a mammal. Here's a mammal. So this, I kind of love this because this is what our ancestors looked like during the age of dinosaurs, you know? In a world ruled by enormous dinosaurs, mammals were already around and they all basically looked like this any in the model and added only one to the mural teeny tiny little guys just to the right of his signature yeah thank you for joining me to hear about rudy's allen very cool masterpiece of art and science the age of reptiles yeah
has for generations, the mural continues to inspire and help define our view of the prehistoric world. Yep. Now you'll be taken back to the main screen of this program where you can choose a section of the mural and look no, don't listen. That's not true. What? I am commander of this live stream. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful tour. But uh, we're going to talk about what I'm going to talk about here. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I bet you it is from a DVD. I think you're right there. Yeah. So, like I said, this is an incredibly influential piece of art. I mean, holy moly. Here is a U.S. postage stamp from the 1970s featured here. And it's not just in the U.S. In far-flung countries like Iraq, here was a, like, copycat set of stamps that were produced. <laughs> oh, I love this. This is so cool. But look, this is a copy of the original right here. Very, very neat. I don't know of any dinosaurs that have ever been found in Iraq. No no Mesozoic dinosaurs, at least. But here we've got Dimetrodon. We've got... Is that... Hang... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang, hang on a minute. Is that a Dorling Kindersley Giganotosaurus right there? Oh, boy. Uh... I'm just noticing this now, and it looks like this was, like, copy-pasted. This might be some stolen artwork. Um. Yeah. This likes, look, looks like the Dorling Kindersley Giganotosaurus model. Right here, but, like, flipped and... Giganotosaurus. And, uh... Giganotosaurus. Let me see if I can find you a better example. Uh, photographed from the same angle. Uh... Right there. Giganotosaurus. Which we were talking about earlier. Uh, Giganotosaurus. Giganotosaurus. <laughs> I'm pretty I'm pretty sure they just snagged that and <laughs> and put it on a national postage stamp. Um here. Uh I'll put image in new tab. There's that right there. Let me see if I can Yeah. Here we are. And... There we go. Whoop. Gah. Here it is right here. And right here. I really think... Yeah. No, they totally did. Oh boy, that's a smoking gun right there. Gah. Here, let's make this bigger. Yeah. You see what I'm talking about here? <laughs> That's totally it. Yeah. Oh, boy. Slightly different angle to the head. Yeah. I mean, it, but it, it's clearly the same model. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, I suppose this whole thing is, you know, directly inspired by, you could argue, stolen from. Uh, Zellinger art right here. But yeah, this has had a tremendous influence on, uh, on the history of dinosaur art, especially in pop culture. So yeah.
Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And Iraq in Iraq, British law can't reach you. You know, fair enough. This is from 2010. 2010? This is during the US occupation. Well, we all know Iraq became much more lawless during the US occupation, so that honestly makes a lot a lot of sense. But uh yeah. Anyway. Man, did we mess up that country. Uh But here is a web page from Don Glute. Don Glute is here is with a Myasaurus skull right there. Yeah, I met Don Glute back in 2013 at the uh, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting in Los Angeles, where he lives, I think. Um, but yeah, he's kind of a professional dinosaur fan. He has produced several dinosaur films. Anyway, maybe maybe don't look at all the pictures on his website. Those who know, know. But uh, anyway, nice guy, Don Glute. Um, but yeah, during the 1950s and through the 1960s, Rudolf Zellinger's early Tyrannosaurus design, due to its exposure in Life Magazine's The World We Live In series, more or less became the standard for this dinosaur's image. Copies, sometimes slightly altered, appearing again and again as book illustrations, comic book art, advertisements, toys, most notably those made by both Miller and Mark's companies. Yeah. Yep. Direct copies of Zellinger's T-Rex. Again, the T-Rex right here. Kapow! Right there. Right there. To a, a practiced eye to somebody who's seen a, a million zillion dinosaur illustrations over the years, this is plain as day, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> uh, yep. There's his Dimetrodon right there, directly copied right here. Uh. So, yeah. Yeah. Anywho. Uh. Yep. Uh, a small number of examples are shown here. That is a super direct copy. Holy cow. Look at that. <laughs> oh, they just snatched that. You know, this is before you could copy paste. But here is another artist just like directly copying this. There you go. And multiple, like these are all taken from Charles R. Knight illustrations over here. And there's Zellinger. Yeah, shoot. Uh, and this is from, I don't know, they're selling some kind of thing here. Thrilling rare fossil collection. Yeah, vividly recreate life before man. Yeah, uh, there's an illustration from Boy's Life magazine, from the Little Golden Book, from then to now, from Turok, Son of Stone. These are all direct copies from Gorgo comic. Yeah. Pretty astonishing. And there we go. For the 1957 movie, The Lost Continent. Uh, or no, The Land Unknown? The Land Unknown. That Tyrannosaurus, a direct copy of the one from Zalinger's Age of Reptiles. Yeah. Um... It's pretty funny that, like, once you become familiar with, with dinosaurs in art, once you become a, a paleo art connoisseur, you know, you start to notice these same motifs created again and again and again. And, uh, yeah. It's funny. In the early 20th century, there was not a whole lot of uh, of dinosaur media to speak of back then. And so anything that was remotely popular became incredibly influential, and everybody else copied it. At the time, if you were to visit your local public library to find more in information on dinosaurs, there might be one book, maybe two or something like that. 
if you're lucky, there was no internet at the time. Quite obviously. You know, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Everybody copied from the same sources. Very limited reference material. So works like Zalinger's Age of Reptiles were incredibly influential. You know? Yeah. And Paleostream says we're in the process of publishing a paper about dinosaurs in comics. Preprint is already out that talks about that. Paleostream, could you whisper me a, a copy of the preprint? I would love to take a look at that. That sounds really, really fascinating. Holy cow. Please, please, if you don't mind, I would, I'd love, email me a copy, whisper it to me, send it in a Twitter message, whatever. I'd, I'd love to see that. Yeah. Uh, 1950s internet was lame. Yeah, it didn't, well, you might even argue it wasn't even around yet, Get Black. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, you had all of those? Snowfall? Very cool. Very, very cool. Well, here's a link to this. And thank you for the support, Travel the World. I will indeed travel. Thank you, thank you. Did something arrive on my doorstep? Ooh, travel. Here, let me give you this link to this. Let me actually check... Give me just a second here. Here, we'll start our, uh... Ugh, another video right here. Uh... Here, let's have... Here's paleontologist Bob Bakker in an interview talking about uh, the Zellinger mural showing up in Life magazine. This September 7th, 1957 edition of Life magazine. He's going to talk about this and how that helped inspire him to be a paleontologist when he was a child. Um, and I'm going to go check on the mail real quick. I will be right back. Don't you get bored with field work? I don't get bored at all. For the same reason that that Life magazine grabbed me, that's September 7th, 1953. I saw it in the spring of, of 54. I opened that magazine. I was 10 years old in the fourth grade. I opened this magazine. My grandpa's house in the, in the living room with the big um, sunny windows in New Jersey. And it wasn't just an article about dinosaurs. It wasn't. And it wasn't just pictures of prehistoric animals, although there were really good ones. It was a beautifully written story and narrative of life from the very beginning with pictures of fossil jellyfish through trilobites and armored squid and the uh, earliest fishes and the earliest land plants. Thank you, Paleostream. Back from Texas to Metrodon that we're digging up now. And the early dinosaurs who were little and the later dinosaurs, the little fur balls, and the dinosaurs go extinct, and then there were bigger mammals and bigger and bigger and bigger, and mammoths and mastodons, saber tooth cats. It was an incredible story, and it seemed to be absolutely boundless. Hmm. So many kinds of animals and plants and bugs through so many slices of geological time that there was no way you could ever get to the end. It was like a zoo that never, never ceased. It was incredible. And field work is like that. Every time I go out, there's stuff that we didn't expect. And there are mysteries. Because to understand life through time, you got to understand hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of burials. Each animal has an individual story. Each T. rex or thin back dimetrodon, that individual animal has a story. Mm -hmm. And it died, and it's death and burial. That's a story. That's a crime scene. And to understand all Demetrodons 300 million years ago, you got to look at dozens and dozens and dozens of them, their babies, the half-grown ones, and the animals they lived with, the type of soil they Ooh. walked on, how they yeah. traveled all over the world. So it, it's, you can't get bored. People yeah. who work at zoos don't get bored. Either for the same reason, life <laughs> is inexhaustible. True. The discovery of old and new types of dinosaur fossils and information. Mm. 
Anyway, so yeah, that's Bob Bakker talking about the influence of the Zellinger mural upon him. And uh, he he's talked about this many times. You know, it being uh, one of the reasons that he got into paleontology in the first place. So yeah, yeah, very cool. And uh, Dimetrodon was showing up as Dementia Dog. Oh, no. In the transcript. <laughs> Miss Tricky, and that's good stuff. Holy cow. Um, and Travel the World. Thank you, by the way, for the 100 bits earlier. Thank you also for sending this to me, whatever it is. Let's open this up right now, Travel. Travel, did did you send this? Uh There's multiple slips in here, packing slips. And travel, thank you so so much. Holy cow. Here, let me redact your name real quick. Cool. Freedom of Information Act here and uh There we go. Redacted. Travel the world says, Hello, Danny. Just a little something from your Amazon gift list. Have a great stream and, and keep it, keep doing what you enjoy. Travel the world. Thank you so much, Travel. This means so much to me. It really does. Holy cow. So these might not seem like the most exciting gifts, but these are things that I will 100% use on the regular. We've got some masking tape, which I need for when I am uh, smoothing and and especially painting my 3D prints. So thank you, thank you, Travel. Excellent. Excellent stuff. And a tool that I use very, very often, I recognized I need to keep one of these in my car so I can also take it with me into the field. So I'll always have it with me. Pliers like this with snips in the middle. I can bring these with me with my mechanics wire. This plus mechanics wire, which I have over here. Yeah. Mechanics wire, this is what? Eight gauge wire? It's metal wire. I can do more with with this combination of, of tools than like almost anything else. It's incredibly, incredibly useful. The number of times that this combination of things has saved my butt when I'm out in the middle of nowhere, it's more more than I can count. So many different times. So yeah, and this is not quite like baling wire. I think it's a little bit more flexible. I always called this mechanics wire, but any very handy people in chat might have another name for it. I think it's more pliable than uh, than true baling wire. It might be thinner too. But anyway, I love this stuff, and holy cow! Travel the world. Thank you so much for your support, and. Uh, I'll put this right into my car. And you know what? This too, right after today's stream. So that even if I'm caught in the middle of nowhere, I'll have that with me. Thank you, Travel. Thank you very, very much. Good stuff. Yeah. Travel says, I know you always appreciate everything. I really do. Yeah. I did not go to the P.O. Box. That was uh, here at my apartment, Lordy. Yes, indeed. Yeah. You need to go there tomorrow? Yeah, Lordy. Maybe I'll have it. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see who gets to the P.O. Box first. But uh, anyway. Lordy, are you finished with your stream? How did it go? I hope it was really good. Welcome back. Yeah. And is it an armature wire? I use it for armature wire. I use it for... Man, the number of things in my apartment that I've fixed with mechanics wire. Too many to count. 
I once got my Suzuki Samurai up and running again in the field after it... Yeah, I... Mechanics Wire is incredibly useful. I'll be using it a lot in my Velociraptor puppet that I'm working on, too. So, yeah. An okay stream ended up ending a little early. Okay, Lordy. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, if anybody's not yet following Lordy, I heard she cooked some kind of fun dish today. Something really tasty. Lordy is professionally trained as a chef and a baker. And so if you're the sort of person who eats uh, food, you should follow Lordy. Lordy also makes clothing in her crafting stream. So if you're the sort of person who wears clothing, do you wear clothes? Go follow Lordy. Uh, <laughs> basically, <laughs> If you're a person who wears clothes or eats food, go follow Lordy. You know? Um, she Honestly, she's got a very chill stream. It's always a good time. Go follow her. Check out her stream. She's a member of my own stream team. It's me, Lordy, and Ios are all members of the Three's a Crowd stream team. And uh, they are dear, dear friends of mine. I love them dearly. Go follow them. And I occasionally show up on both of their streams, too. So if you want to make sure that you're always catching when I go live, even when I'm not on my own channel, go follow Lordy and Ios there. Oh, yeah. Paleo Stream says, I don't eat. I absorb nutrients directly from the soil. Well, you know, Lordy's also going to get into gardening soon. Paleo Stream. <laughs> Lordy, when are you starting your garden? Oh. <laughs> So yeah, and Shay Ra, how are you doing, Shay Ra? Welcome, welcome. Did you come in with the raid? No, raid? Lordy didn't raid. Anyway, Shay Ra, it's good to have you here. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Paleo Stream says perfect. There you go. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Trappy Jenkins gifted a tier one sub to Shay Ra. Thank you, Trappy Jenkins. Thank you, thank you. Really appreciate that, Trappy. That's lovely. Good stuff. Yeah. You've been lurking for a while. Hi to you too, Shayra. It's great to have you here. Yeah. Enjoy those emotes. Holy cow. Thanks to Trappy Jenkins. You can type in these. Or these. Or these. Or these. Or these. There's a whole plethora of dinosaur emotes at your disposal to use at will for the next 30 days. And the cool thing about dinosaur emotes is... At least what I've found. You can go to any channel on Twitch and you can uh you can decide to spam dinosaur emotes left and right. And rather than people being mad about that, they'll go, whoa. Hang on, hang on. Are those dinosaur emotes? Dinosaur emotes? Where did you get those? Oh, yeah. Use this knowledge only for good. That's a, a powerful force that you've just been gifted there. And with great power comes great, etc. Great response to Trilitrance, you know? Uh, as the saying goes. For all our sanity, I will not spam emotes. Thank you, Paleostream. Although, if they're dinosaur emotes, Paleostream, and I mean not stem archosaurs, and not even avian dinosaurs, I'm talking about the grade non avian dinosaurs here. Those are fair game, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Where was that? Yeah.
<laughs> oh boy. What's the classic line with great power? Because with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Uh, anyway, yeah. Good stuff. You can't hear it, Shayra. One more time? Hmm. Let's try this again. Then you got to be willing to blast up on some carries. Because with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Uh, yeah, good stuff. And I feel like I have a distinct bit of response to Trilitrance in this broadcast to show you this next video about the conservation of the Zellinger mural here. Uh, so here's a guided tour of the mural during its restoration. This video is entitled The Age of Reptiles So Close You Could Touch It. Hello everybody, welcome to the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. Here we are right now in the Great Hall, which some of you uh, may recognize and some may not because of how it looks right now. Holy cow, it's empty. All of these dinosaur fossils and everything have been moved out of this hall. Normally, you know, um, this hall would look... Oh boy. It would look like this. Right here. But, uh... This is what it looks like right now. So this video came out of... A little over a year ago? Something like that? Uh... So yeah, yeah. Uh, it's currently being renovated. It might... I, I bet you they're still working on it right now in uh, March of 2023. But anyway, the mural is behind this right here. And she is a conservator at the museum. She's going to take us on a personal tour behind this to get up and close with that mural. Up on the scaffold. This is really, really cool. May recognize and some may not because of yeah. the right now. Um, and as I promised, we're going to be talking about uh, the Age of Reptiles mural by Rudolf Salinger. Yeah. What's interesting is that we are now going uh, through a major renovation of our museum. <laughs> <laughs> will provide 50% more exhibit space and a lot of opportunities for education and outreach. And that means... That Hang on. This is what... Oh, it's it's beautiful. They're going to have their apatosaur no longer dragging its tail. Uh, they're, I guess they're going to open up the skylights again. That's going to be really, really cool. They used to have these beautiful skylights there in the museum. I've never been, but I've read about this and I've seen pictures. Um, oh man, that's going to be beautiful. Yale is, you know, there was a time when the Yale Peabody Museum was at the forefront of dinosaur paleontology. And this was in the late 1800s, you know, the late 19th century. And then again, I guess, uh, in the late 1960s, early 1970s with John Ostrom and Deinonychus. And then never again. <laughs> So, it's it's lovely that they're gonna, yeah, that they're gonna update things. So good for them, yeah. Uh, private Frone tour, it's a hundred percent. I think gonna be a a privately funded thing. If Yale University is anything like Princeton or Harvard, they've got like a multi billion dollar endowment, and this is all gonna be pub uh, privately funded. You know. Um, yeah. ...opportunities for education and outreach. And that means that if we're doing this renovation, we need to protect this mural during construction. And you can see right now this amazing scaffold 
that Turner Construction very, very cool. for us. And we call it a working scaffold because huh. it not only protects the mural, and I will show you how in a minute, it also Ooh. allows us to work inside the space if we ever need to. For example, very cool. we have conservators and painting conservators working up there already, and where they were cleaning the mural and doing other uh, preparation work before um, the big construction begins. So let's just go and take a look at the mural. Very, very neat. So I like how they sped up this part. But this is basically so, you know, all of this is built here. So those are not open. That's Those are windows there. No sign of disgrace or failure. In fact, in a world full of changing environments and occasional catastrophe, all species eventually become extinct. Wow, already? Become extinct. Thank you for helping me prevent extinction here, Afro Bandit Girl. With your seven months of support, thanks for helping me avoid extinction for the past seven months. I'm a scientist. I can count. <laughs> Afro Bandit Girl, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, really, really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, these are, there's probably like, they've got glass or probably more likely acrylic over this to keep sawdust and paint and all that other junk off of the mural as they renovate the main exhibit hall here. And she's going to show us the rest of this. So let's just go and take a look. Yeah. This is the first floor. We have two different floors. I like how they're locked for security. It's so big that it requires 34 meters long, 110 feet. Come on in. It's got two floors. That's crazy. Look at this. So that's just gives you an idea of the scale. Inside uh, the first level of the scaffold, that is very cool. So you see the uh, the feet of the Tyrannosaurus right here, and there's our Ankylosaurus right there too. Yeah, everybody loves Ankylosaurus. Mural that we felt that we really, really needed to protect during our renovation. And yep. um, this mural is 110 feet long by 16 feet high. So that's why we need those two levels to be able. Amazing. To Work up here and uh, monitor the There's our ankylosaurus. while the construction is going. So this means that some of those dinosaurs are actually life-sized, which is really, really cool. And we have several things going on. One of them that you saw as I was coming in was the light. We yeah. don't have all the lights on all the time. We only turn them on while um, we are doing these uh, monitoring and checks of the mural. We also have... The structure that is closed, but also we have these windows. Yep, see, that's acrylic right there, like I was telling you. They've got windows here. So from downstairs, we can see what's going on. We also have security. This is a space that is locked, and it has um, cameras. So we are really, really interested in protecting um, this amazing work of art. And David Delaun says artists must have been paid by the art. Well, that's the thing, David Delaun. That's the whole reason that we're talking about this today is because it was on this very day in 1942 that artist Rudolf Zallinger was hired uh, by the Yale Peabody Museum to paint his famous Age of Reptiles fresco. Uh, I don't know if he was paid by the hour. Maybe he was. It took five years to complete, almost. <laughs> At first, they were just going to pay him to... To make like a a few different paintings kind of showing, yeah, like here's a dinosaur skeleton down on the floor. Here's what the dinosaur would look like when it was alive. Painting. And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to make a huge mural. A panorama through time. And in the process, he created one of the greatest works of human artistry ever painted just exquisite you know Sistine Chapel eat your heart out Rudolf Zellinger's Age of Reptiles completed in 1947 
in my opinion, one of the greatest pieces of human artistry ever created. Just absolutely exquisite. And here it is. Up close and personal. This mural was painted uh, by Rudolf Stallinger from uh, 1943 yeah. to 1947. And in 1949, it actually won a Pulitzer Prize because it's absolutely stunning. So yeah. you can walk and appreciate Look at that. Um, the absolute, absolute beauty of this mural. And you know what? Let's go Incredible. to the end of the mural so we can start um, some history of life. As we I'm going to start way back in the Devonian period. Yeah. There's that Archaeopteryx. Yeah. This is so cool. This is so cool. Yeah. Uh. Some people call this mural like the dinosaurs mural, or as the title says, the age of reptiles. But yeah, but, oh, oh man, is she going to get this right? Oh, it's going to make me so happy if she gets this right. It doesn't, so this, this, you know, this is called the Age of Reptiles mural. Um, uh, let me show you the Wikipedia article for this. Gabow, there we go. Yeah, the Age of Reptiles by Rudolf Zallinger. Here is... Oh, boy. Um, I don't know why the link is all chueco, all capicaje, but, but there it is. Um, yeah, it doesn't actually start in the Age of Reptiles in the Mesozoic Era. It starts before, way back in the Devonian period. So, uh, there we go. Let's go back to linear time. Here's the Age of Reptiles right here in blue, the Mesozoic Era. This mural starts earlier. Back in the Devonian period of the Paleozoic Era. Yeah. And then it goes up through the Carboniferous and the Permian. And then into the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. The Age of Dinosaurs here in blue. And I... I will be so happy if our guide here correctly points this out. Let's... Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Actually, it starts even before that. Because we begin... Um, in the Devonian? Yeah! <laughs> yes, indeed! She knows her stuff. Major props. This is a woman who knows what she's talking about. Holy cow. Give this woman a raise. Yeah! <laughs> oh, that makes me so happy. It, it really, really does. Um, ah, uh, that's lovely. Not... A bureaucrat, not somebody who's just oh, kind of stumbled in this job. She really knows what she's talking about. She is passionate about this. She is dedicated to preserving and maintaining this amazing piece of art. Holy cow. Um, major props to her. Paleontologizing salute to uh, to our conservator here. What What is her name? Uh, shoot, I didn't catch that. Well, we're at, here, hang on. Let's grab that, 406. And at the very beginning, what was her name? Uh, Mariana Di Giacomo? That might be Mariana Di Giacomo right there. Let's see. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. Here we are right now in the Oh, she didn't say her name, but that's that's probably her right there. Oh, uh, probably Mariana Di Giacomo. I I detected the faint, just the faintest hints of an accent right there. Could be an Italian accent. Oh yeah, yeah. Anyway, good for her. Holy cow! What a wonderful guide. Moving um, through the Carboniferous and then the Permian, and after yeah. the Mesozoic. Is when the dinosaurs um, started being so important and reigned the earth. But another thing that I can show you. Ooh. That may seem a little like what is this thing? Here. 
Ooh, is that a... Is that a humidity gauge right there? I've seen these before. In paleontological collections. I bet you that's a humidity gauge. Yeah. Uh, this is a temperature and relative humidity monitor. So this bow. Is another thing yeah. Monitoring in this space. We have one Excellent. in this level and one in the upper level as well. And this allows us to know how the environment is in here. And also we have air that is filtered. So the air that is in here is not the same air that is outside during construction. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, another amazing thing about this mural is the amount of detail. So there are... Look at that. Look at these beautiful, beautiful horsetails painted here. Just extraordinary. I mean, it, uh, like I said, Sistine Chapel, eat your heart out. Michelangelo, take a back seat. This is these are details that you would not be able to see from the floor of the Yale Peabody Museum. And here it is, just extraordinary right there. Beautiful. So many gorgeous brush strokes that you can appreciate yeah. as you uh, come close. And <laughs> if you're looking at it from below, uh. you appreciate how gorgeous it is, but it is not as easy to see the amount of detail. Um, yep. When Salinger was painting this mural, he was using, um, first he made a tempera version of it, yep. and then he took some photographs and he uh, did some grids on those photos. And then when this wall was all plastered, he came and he did those same grids on the wall and then started um, Look at that. from his photos each one of those grids. And so once he finished all that drawing, that's when he started painting. And that's why it took him three and a half years to finish this um, gorgeous project. Holy cow. I think cow. we should go actually to the upper level so we can see some really, really cool dinosaurs. Yes, indeed. You got to go to the upper floor to see the dinosaurs. The second level of the scaffold right next to one of my friends, the brontosaurus. <laughs> now known as a patasaurus, usually. Somebody type in exclamation mark brontosaurus um, for the command there. But uh, but yeah, yeah, look at that eyeball. Holy cow. Like the amount of personality in that. Ah. Look at it. It has the most beautiful eyes. Of course, we have no idea how the eyes looked, but to Salinger, this is how they looked. We don't have no idea. They probably didn't look like that. They probably didn't have like the that almost looks like a cat eye, where it's like a, like a slit. So uh, it would probably look more like I don't know, an eagle eye or something like that. Um. Yeah, this is probably a closer approximation to what a dinosaur eye would look like. Um. You know. Something like that. Round pupil, most likely. That's our general consensus nowadays. But, uh... Anyway. Still really lovely. Really lovely. No idea how the eyes looked, but to Salinger, this is how they looked. And they are yeah. absolutely stunning. And, and Shay Ra says, why not goat eyes? Goats have incredibly weird eyes, <laughs> Shay Ra. They've got, like, octagonal pupils. They're really, they're really strange. Um... Yeah, anyway, when we're when we're looking at at a dinosaur like this and we're trying to figure out something about it that's really difficult to determine you know, from uh from just fossils. We typically use what we call the good old EPB. This is what we call the uh annotate this. We call this the extant phylogenetic bracket, or EPB. So, 
I don't know, like my old crew chief used to say, Oh, the EPP, that's just crocs and emus. And that's basically, he's right. You know? It's crocodiles and emus. You know, emus are big flightless birds, so they're pretty good analog to dinosaurs, and then we've got crocodiles. So the closest living relatives of dinosaurs are birds. Birds themselves are living dinosaurs. They're the only dinosaurs that survived the asteroid impact at the end of the Cretaceous. They evolved from dinosaurs, so they are dinosaurs. And then there's crocodiles, who are kind of like the closest other cousins to dinosaurs. So we can know things about birds by studying them today. We can dissect them in the laboratory. Same with crocodiles, if we're careful. You know? Don't let them bite you. So for things that are unknown about dinosaurs, we can study their closest living relatives, birds who are living dinosaurs, and crocodiles who are the dinosaurs' other closest living relatives. And so if we want to know what do dinosaur eyes look like, Um, yeah, we can look at birds, and then we can look at crocodiles. So yeah, eyes don't fossilize. So, uh, yeah. So we, uh, burp. come on. So we look at modern creatures and their eyes. Eyes are really squishy things. They don't fossilize well. Um, but yeah. Yeah. They do kind of look like crocodile eyes for an auteur. And that's probably what Rudolf Salinger was looking at. That was probably his reasoning in painting the eyes like this. It was not just to Salinger. Because one thing that we know about Here. eyes. Of course we have no oh. look at it. It has the most beautiful eyes. They are gorgeous. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely stunning. And yeah. he, it was not just to Salinger, <laughs> because one thing that we know about the way that he worked was that he collaborated with curators of the Yale Peabody Museum to yep. um, find the best and more, most realistic way to capture these animals, and also the nature, all the plants that we have in the mural. He talked to curators and at that time, in the 40s, there was a lot of research being done in paleobotany, and it was Very a perfect cool. time and perfect opportunity for Salinger to talk to all these curators and start thinking about how the plants looked, you know, from what you see in a fossil to what you yep. would have seen if you could have taken the time machine. And, of course, the dinosaurs themselves were also a big, big important feature. Look at that Archaeopteryx, beautiful. how the was and how um, you can turn those bones into an actual animal. You know, the muscles and um, all the soft tissue are not preserved <laughs> in these animals. And even though today we look at some of these dinosaurs and we think they are outdated, I don't think that's a good way to look at it. I think this She's right. is an amazing capture of how science was telling us uh, dinosaurs and plants looked like um, in the 40s. So it's like a time capsule. This shows us the current state of scientific knowledge back in the 1940s. I think she's absolutely right about that. Yes, indeed. And, uh, yeah, what was I going to look at? Um, Tarquin says, are turtles not closely related to dinosaurs? Not super close, Tarquin. Yeah. Turtles are are honestly still kind of a mystery. Um, yeah. Here we go. We looked at this for the first time yesterday. Beautiful new phylogeny. What is a dinosaur and what isn't? So, this is a, a graphical representation of, of what we call amniotes. So amniotes are critters that lay eggs on dry land. And some critters that no longer lay eggs, but they used to, like mammals. You know, mammals are evolved amniotes. They are derived amniotes. Evolved. Poor, poor choice of words. They're derived amniotes. 
And so in here, uh, dinosaurs start right here. So everything, let's make that bigger. Everything from here up is a dinosaur. You know, you can follow this lineage up here. Zoom, 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 etc. Up throughout the whole dinosaur family tree. Including birds. Birds themselves are living dinosaurs. So everything here is, uh... Is a dinosaur. There's our dinosaurs there. Now, turtles... Uh, who are... Rip. This is kind of an interesting one, because turtles here are... Whoa, hang on. When I scrolled, it made that weird. Anyway. Are here on our Tree of Life. And so they're, they're outside of Dinosauria, you know? They're not dinosaurs. They don't belong to that group. But they're kind of close. This is... Th th yeah, we're not totally sure. Turtles are still kind of mysterious. We're still trying to figure out where exactly they they start. But um, we know that they're not dinosaurs. How close they are to dinosaurs is still a matter of debate. So yeah, and is there a link for that one? There is indeed. Here. Uh, here, if we go back to my Twitter profile. I retweeted this yesterday, I think. So let's have ourselves a little look-see here. There we go. Yeah. Uh, here is a link. There we go. Yeah. Uh, turtles were close to mosasaurs. Well, they're in this picture, they're closer to plesiosaurs than mosasaurs. Mosasaurs are lizards, so they're they're very different from turtles. Um, but yeah, yeah, no worries, Trodingers, no worries. Yeah. Uh. And turtles are closer to plesiosaurs. I mean, we're not totally sure about that. Let's look at another tree of life. Turtles, there's still some debate about them. We're still figuring them out, you know? There are still hardworking people trying to actually figure out these critters. Uh, let's jump to turtles here on this tree of life. Zoom in there. There we go. I like turtles. Uh, 231 living species of turtles. And here on this tree, they're an outgroup of Archosauria. So they belong to Archaeosauria. So archosaurs, you know, birds and crocodiles and dinosaurs. This tree only shows living creatures. So it doesn't show extinct animals like non-avian dinosaurs. The only dinosaurs it shows are birds. So it's kind of a limitation of this particular tree right here. But here, turtles are like the closest living relatives of crocodiles and birds and dinosaurs. Um, there's still some debate about this, you know? So yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot of turtles. Indeed, Tarquin. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, and it comes exactly Golgonek. See, Golgonek has got sharp eyes there. That's the prehistoric planet Titanosaur there, Dreadnoughtus. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Gianmi saw that as well. Anyway, we gotta get back to this video. I, uh, we gotta finish this. So nowadays, we have also great scientists and curators and other researchers at the Peabody doing amazing research on how these dinosaurs not only looked, but also behaved and, um, I think it's very, very exciting to be able to see science yeah. evolve um, from what was in the 40s to what it is right now. And It is very cool. I don't know how much of that work is currently taking place at Yale. Uh, oh, Yale. Uh, not exactly at the forefront of dinosaur paleontology, but... Um... <laughs>
<laughs> and I can say that. It's always punching up, you know, because it's Yale. Um, but yeah, anyway, she's great. This is a wonderful video. Um, so if we consider um, this science aspect as well, Salinger first was tasked to create panels that would go on this wall. Yeah. But as he started thinking about it, he started thinking that maybe that was not what he was supposed to do. Maybe hmm. the idea was that he would create this panorama of life and um, decided to present this new idea that instead of creating these panels, he would paint the whole wall. In this one This is an artist taking initiative and good on him. He's created one of the, the all-time great works of art here. It's really exquisite. Just extraordinary. Was painted yeah. um, while the museum was open. So people, visitors were coming in and looking at all these amazing specimens that we had in place, but also they were looking at Salinger while he was working. And they were able to ask questions if they had them. And so it was a beautiful experience to anybody that would come to the museum. That's really, really neat. Holy cow, it, it kind of reminds me of what I do here. And actually, when I was working... Here, let me recap a little bit. Because you may have missed that. It wasn't... Some of you may have missed it. So, Zellinger, when he was working on this mural, this is while the museum was open. And so there'd be visitors walking around down here. And they'd be admiring these skeletons and learning about these dinosaurs. And they'd see this guy, you know, in his glasses with his artist palette, you know, painting this. And they'd go, hey, what are you doing up there? And he would actually, you know good guy that he was, he would talk to the visitors about this. He would explain what he was working on. He would tell them, like, yes, I'm painting this magnificent, you know, chronological panorama of the age of reptiles, going back into the Devonian, actually. And uh, he'd have chats with visitors, which must have been, rem it must have been so special. Like, to be a visitor, how lucky to be able to to walk into a museum like this and see these remarkable creatures up on display and then talk to an artist creating one of the all-time great works of art. Truly magical. At SciComm in the 1940s, exactly, Golganak. Exactly. And so, shoot, it reminds me of... Uh... Man, when I was working at the... Uh... at the Badlands Dinosaur Museum... in Dickinson, North Dakota. Uh, when my old crew chief, Denver Fowler, got his job here. Shoot, there it is. Uh, we were waiting on some permits from uh, from the U.S. Geological Service, or from, uh, excuse me, from the U.S. De Department of the Interior, from the Bureau of Land Management, from the BLM. We were waiting on permits from them uh, before we could go out and actually do field work that summer. And so, uh, I don't know. We were just kind of sitting around, and I was working on various things for Denver at the museum, doing some illustrations and stuff like that on my laptop. And before, Denver said he was going to set me up behind this door right here, back there inside the collections in the back room. And I said, that's cool, but I see a folding table over there. I said, Denver, can I take that folding table and set it up just over here? So I'm kind of like in among the displays. So if visitors are walking by, you know, I can say hi to them and strike up a conversation. And, you know, talk to them about the exhibits and everything. And, uh, and he's like, ah, sure, go ahead. And so I did. And I borrowed a Triceratops humerus, an upper arm bone of a Triceratops. And I set it there on the desk, and I... I don't remember. I may have had a little sign that said, like, uh, Hi there, I'm a paleontologist. Ask me questions or something. But I had so many wonderful conversations with guests over that about two weeks that we were there waiting on our permits. And uh, it was really excellent, you know? I feel like in some way that kind of set me up for... You're not doing so badly yourself for a paleontologist. Well, thank you, Carrot Apple, for the follow, and welcome to Paleontologizer. It's good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Paleontologizer. 
But I feel like in some way that, that kind of set me up for, for streaming here on Twitch. You know, people come in, they ask questions, try to answer them. You know, you just kind of see where things go. You have a heart to heart and, uh, yeah, that's what true science outreach is, I think. You know, you meet people where they are, you answer their questions, you try and get them excited about science. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Invisible Dimensions says, very cool, Danny, and now you're on Twitch? There you go. Yeah. Uh, and Schrodinger's Donut wanted to know, can you put the horseshoe crab on the Tree of Life? I can do that real quick. Let's zoom from... Uh, Let's go back to all life. There we go. And then we'll go to genus Limulus, the horseshoe crab. Which is not a crab, nor is it a horse, nor is it a shoe. The horseshoe crab is not one of any of those three. It's a kind of stem arthropod, kind of. Well, it's kind of between insects and crustaceans, or anyway. Uh, Limulus. There we go. We'll dive down there. And we'll find that critter. Yeah. Limulus. Horseshoe crab. Really cool critter. But it's there. Uh, horseshoe crabs. There you go. Chelicerata. So it's related to spiders and scorpions. And mites and ticks. So I guess it's closer to spiders than it is to insects. But, uh... Yeah, anyway. But it's a, a really early diverging branch from crustaceans, insects, and more. You know, like beverages and more, but even more creepy crawly. Yeah. It's related to spiders, yeah. It's not a crab, Schrodinger's Donut. They're not crabs. Yeah. Look them up on Wikipedia. They're really fascinating animals. I'm resisting the urge to get drawn into a, a rabbit hole about horseshoe crabs because they're very interesting. But we've got to continue our discussion here about the Age of Reptiles mural. Looking at all these amazing yeah. species that we had in place, but also they were looking at Salinger while he was working. And they were I love this. questions if they had them. And so it was a That's so cool. To anybody that would come to the museum and live... Uh, the painting of the Age of Reptiles. That's so, so neat. Um, another thing that we have down here is our friend the Stegosaurus. He is in a weird spot. Stegosaurus. Because um, the floor of this second level is kind of in front of his face. Yeah. But um, it's one of those amazing skeletons that we had in the Great Hall that inspired um, the all the characters, let's call them, that were going to be in this mural. And so Very cool. the cases that were underneath the mural that take up those um, There's a Daphosaurus. Of Beautiful. That Salinger did not paint. Uh, those uh, <laughs> specimens that were there were inspiring also what he would have captured. Ah, uh, incredible. And another thing that's really cool to see is that we have these very, very tall trees that go um, all throughout the mural. And they kind of separate the time periods. They are separating these time periods. So the, the trees not only inform about the nature and how um, plants looked in these different times, but uh, aesthetically, they have the function of separating all these time periods starting in the Devonian and going towards the Cretaceous. Very, very cool. And hang on a minute. I've never noticed this before, but take a look at this. There's a close-up here of some of the painting. Wow. Um, and look at the texture here, how it's kind of like, kind of cracked and just and very like antique looking like that. That's not... That's not in the original painting. This is where that took place over the years. This is 100% like fresco wear and tear right there. Holy moly. Anybody who's visited, 
you know, I, I don't, I'm guessing, you know, Rome, Napoli, uh, areas like that where you might find very old frescoes like this, you'll probably recognize the same kind of wear pattern. You know, the, the kind of cracking like that. This is painted directly onto plaster. It is a true fresco. This is a fresco secco, uh, you know, style of painting right here. Um, yeah. Does anybody else recognize this? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, shoot. Yeah. There we go. Just like this in a, in other frescoes that you see around the world. Well, primarily in Italy. But yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff. Now, an important thing to note is that, uh, <laughs> is that in uh, renovating the hall at the Peabody Museum at Yale, You'll probably hear, I bet our, our conservator here will talk about this maybe in a few minutes, but they're not here to restore the actual paintings themselves, you know? They're not in the business of uh, <laughs> doing this. <laughs> uh, is anybody familiar with this? Oh, boy. Yeah. Not trying to do that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. Uh. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, they're not doing that kind of thing so they're just here to, to preserve this and clean it they're not actually going to cover up any of Zellinger's brush strokes or anything that's not what they're doing but, yeah uh, aesthetically they have the function of separating all these time periods starting in the Devonian and going towards the Cretaceous it is, it is a very very cool thing if I were a paleobotanist maybe I'd be more in tune to this but it really is cool watching the plants transform throughout the Zellinger's mural as well, because the plants, holy cow, they change as much as the animals do, if not more. It's really, really, really neat to see. Uh, Zellinger was intensely focused on the plants, and he was actually tutored by a vertebrate paleontologist and I believe a paleobotanist when he was creating all this. He had to take like a nine-month crash course in paleontology, learning all about these critters and the plants that they lived alongside and lived with. Really, really cool stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. So, let's look at another friend. Ooh. And like I promised, this is our T-Rex. Yep. Absolutely amazing. And, of course, it's eyes. Look at that eye. They just show so much terror. But one cool thing about the mural <laughs> Yeah. Eating another, but we don't even know which dinosaur he's eating. So yep. he's not eating anybody's favorite. Uh, <laughs> but we do have a T Rex. And Very cool. One thing that I can tell you about this T Rex is that, first of all, it inspired uh, the. Pay close attention to this, and we'll be talking about this at the very end of our broadcast. But yeah. What is very cool about this Tyrannosaurus? Not only was it copied a million times by other artists, but the King of the Monsters himself was inspired by this particular painting here. About this T-Rex is that, first of all, it inspired uh, the design of Godzilla. Yes, indeed. You heard that correctly. Godzilla. 
Uh, Caliban, yes indeed, Godzilla. My childhood hero. The design for Godzilla was inspired by this very painting here. Um, very, very cool. This one over here is what created that image of Godzilla. And... Yeah. We'll probably talk about this at the very, very end, but, uh, but yeah. I'm an and so I see and I look at things, and one thing that I can show you about this here that I absolutely love is if Check this out. In this area over here, Ballinger decided to change his mind and yep. cover some of these teeth. So you can see it right there. There's a tooth right there that was originally painted on. And Zellinger is like, oh, I don't know. It looks like too many teeth. This tooth looks maybe too broad at the end. He covered it up. And it looks like right here, too. You can kind of see that. Yeah. Probably thought it had too many or they were too crowded. And so he covered some of them. So you can see oh. the artist also there. You can not only see the T-Rex, but you can see Zellinger's hand. That's very that cool. I absolutely love. Very, Another very cool. Thing that I see... Which is not as happy, but it's what it is. Um, it's some of the deterioration that we can see on the sky. Yeah, and look at that. The areas where we can see it more clearly. Yep. And unfortunately, that's yeah. one of the risks that we can have when working with this fiscal cycle technique and other uh, murals. But in this case, um, some of this degradation, unfortunately, is from that plaster interacting with mm. the paint. And there isn't much we can do. We could paint it over, but that would be um, unethical of us. And we would be covering Salinger's work. And that is not something that we want to do. Because also, when you look at this thing... So again, none of this going on. They're not doing that there. And good on them. Holy cow. Uh... Yeah. And we would be covering Salinger's work, and that is not something that we want to do. Because also, when yeah. you look at this painting, you can see how thin the paint layer is. And if we start painting things over, or we start doing too much, we lose that beautiful matte texture yeah. that um, he decided that was going to be uh, what he wanted to show in this mural. Oh, one of the great American works of art, just truly incredible. And Look at that. The mural is ah. a volcano, or actually Beautiful. several volcanoes that we have. Because um, if you look at the mural when you're inside the Great Hall, you would think, why is it painted from the right to the left? And it's because ah. and that's a good point, actually. Why right to left? As Americans or, or people who you know read English, we read from left to right. Usually chronological order goes from left to right. See how I did that? I know you're watching from the the other angle here. I don't have the camera reversed. This is this is true to life here. So I got I got to reverse it for myself. From left to right. That's how you read. But that's not how the fresco is here. It goes from right to left. Why? Is it painted from the right to the left, and it's because the cases uh, were displayed in that way, and you would come into the Great Hall from that door over there and transition into the Mammal Hall on the other side. And you are absolutely correct, Tarquin. You did call it. Very nice. And so the history of time was best told in this direction. And so yep. why is this volcano here? It's because in the 40s, this was thought to be the reason why dinosaurs were no longer with us. So why they had become extinct. So nowadays, there's a few things wrong with that. We recognize that yet yeah, dinosaurs are still with us. In the form of birds. Birds are living dinosaurs. So strictly speaking, dinosaurs never went completely extinct. But also, there's still some debate about this, but... The growing consensus in the paleontological community is that the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs was caused not by volcanic eruptions, but by the impact of a giant rock from outer space hit the Earth 66 million years ago. Gigantic asteroid. Yeah. That idea would come about in the 1980s. So like a full 
almost 40 years after Zalinger started on this mural. So yeah. Yeah. This is another example of how the science continues to evolve, but we still have uh, this history of science shown in this absolutely gorgeous mural. And another thing that's also very cool, cool is that if you look at the mural from its beginning to here, you will see some color transitions. You see ah. it start in that very pinkish tone, and then huh. showing that it was a hot and humid environment. And as we keep progressing, things start clearing up until we come here into the Cretaceous. And then that's pretty funny, actually, because things actually got hotter at the end of the Cretaceous and then into the Paleocene and Eocene, getting to the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. Temperatures are actually increasing in the late Cretaceous when you had ty critters like Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops running around. Um, so that part we now recognize is wrong, too. But really interesting that this was the thinking at the time in the 40s. And then again, we have this, um, these clouds and uh, the lava that is in this area as well. Huh. I'll show you one last thing, which is one of my favorite things in the whole mural. Ooh. Okay, so I have a confession to make. Even though this mural is the age of reptiles, I'm a mammals girl. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm done with this video now. Mammals. <laughs> no, of course, mammals... Some of my very best friends are mammals. You know, mammals are worthy of our respect. Heck, I'm a mammal, you know? Um, so, yeah, yeah. Anyway, she's going to show us the only mammal here in the mural, which did not appear in the model, only in the final mural by Zalinger. Check this out. So, here is here. one of my favorite things in the whole mural. Okay, so I have a confession to make. Even though this mural is the age of reptiles, I'm a mammals girl. And so, <laughs> here you can see... The only, the one and only mammal that we have in this mural. And that's so funny that it's larger than life size. <laughs> like, this is bigger than almost every Mesozoic mammal here, which is really funny. But yeah. Which Salinger actually painted after the fact. That was not something that he had yeah. initially. And if you had any doubts that this is a real Salinger mural, we have his signature right here. It's beautiful. So, this is a stunning work of art that we absolutely love. Uh, cameo appearance. You could even say Limey Show. Maybe a, some sort of a Mesozoic self-portrait right there. Right next to his signature. <laughs> Good stuff. This is a stunning work of art that we absolutely love at the Yale Peabody Museum. And yeah. we're so excited to be able to protect during this renovation that we're going through. And we're actually very excited to be able to give you this tour so you can see the mural from really, really up close, which is something that is a very, very unique opportunity. So thank you so much for joining us and keep Pretty enjoying neat. all the tours of spinach. Very, very cool. I'll give you a link to this video here. Our, our tour guide was Mariana De Giacomo. Thank you, Mariana. Brilliant. Lovely to have your expertise. That was exquisite. So lucky to have that. Holy cow. Um, I probably would have not done this live stream like this if we didn't have that remarkable video there. So really, really, really cool. Now, before we wrap up, I think I promised something. Didn't I in our uh, in our going live message here? Yeah. Here we go. So I said we're talking about Dinosaur Science's Sistine Chapel today and how that art inspired the design for Godzilla? She did mention that. That was back right... Here, I didn't make that up. Yeah. I promised. This is our T Rex. They just show violent dinosaurs, but we do have a T Rex. And yeah. One thing that I can tell you about this T Rex is that, first of all, it inspired uh, the design 
of Godzilla. So not making that up. Yeah. Godzilla this Lenina. Yes indeed. So there's a few different sources of information about this. I was trying to find a video clip earlier and I I don't know, I couldn't quite find it in time. We had an early stream start today, so yeah. But if anybody here is a Godzilla fan, I have a book. Holy cow, do I have a book recommendation for you. The best scholarly book that I know of on Godzilla. Really, the only scholarly book that I know of on Godzilla. Is this right here by William Sutswe. Godzilla on my mind. 50 Years of the King of Monsters. Phenomenal book. Really, really excellent stuff. Um... All about Godzilla as a cultural phenomenon. There's a history of the movies in this. There's So this was written just before the release of... Uh, shoot, this is around 2003, something like that? 2002, 2003? So it was before the end of the Shinsai Godzilla series. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a few anecdotes about the production of the original film here that I would like to read to you real quick. And uh, one of them does have uh, some information about Godzilla, the like original creature design's origins and how they come from Rudolf Zallinger. But first, uh, yeah, let me read this for you real quick. Yeah. So the special effects for Gojira, which is the original 1954 movie, were not high tech even for the time, but they were painstakingly staged and can still be admired as chillingly convincing. Today's movie audiences, jaded by the latest spectacles of computer-generated animation, may snigger at a few of the effects in the original Godzilla, as admittedly do I. A toy-like helicopter blown about in a gale, a miniature fire engine with a tiny with tiny fake firemen, at the overall depiction of the monster taking it to Tokyo remains visually arresting and surprisingly realistic after 50 years. And a technological revolution later. Suburaya, that's A.G. Suburaya, who is the special effects director from the film, uh, was meticulous in creating 1 25th scale miniatures of Japan's capital city. His model buildings were often detailed inside as well as out and would look most convincing when trampled. He built electric pylons out of wax that could be melted with heat lamps to simulate the impact of Godzilla's radioactive ray. Hundreds of small pyrotechnic charges were installed and ignited. Subarai's commitment to realism even got him into trouble with the law. One day, before filming began, the special effects master and his assistants gathered on the roof garden of one of the Tony department stores in the Ginza district of Tokyo. Looked in, uh, they looked out over the city and charted Godzilla's path of destruction. An alert security guard overheard them and thinking that he'd stumbled onto it. Oh, Nat the Squirrel, thank you for the follow. He was the terror of his neighborhood. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Let's get back to that. So Eiji Tsuburaya, the special effects director for the original Godzilla film, he's there with his, uh, his people and they're on the top of a... Uh, uh, of a building in Tokyo, and they're out looking over this, and they're trying to pat like chart out Godzilla's path of destruction in the film. Uh, an alert security guard overheard them, and think he'd, thinking he'd stumbled onto a terrorist plot, informed the authorities. The police eventually let Tsuburaya go, and he went on to create one of the great sequences of urban devastation in cinematic history. In 1954's film, Gojira which would be released two years later in the U.S., uh, 1956, as Godzilla, King of the Monsters. But the design of the Godzilla suit was drawn from picture books of dinosaurs, as well as some illustrations in an issue of Life magazine. And the distinctive physical appearance of the monster was formed from a fossil record be damned fusion of Tyrannosaurus, Iguanodon, and Stegosaurus. The costume itself was fabricated from a framework of bamboo stakes and wire with thick overlays of latex and plentiful padding of urethane foam. Here's a picture of the original... That's, that's not the original one. That's from... Oh, shoot. That's got to be from Godzilla vs. Mothra? Or Mothra vs. Godzilla, 1964? 
Um, oh, there's the caption, yeah. Godzilla vs. The Thing. But there is uh, Haruo Nakajima, who is the original Godzilla, uh, like, suitmation actor and a legend in his own right. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. Rest in peace indeed, Gianmei. He's, he's a legend. Yeah. So it was this 1953 issue, you know, one year before Godzilla was released in Japan, and just around the time that pre-production started on the film, that's when this came out, with Rudolf Zellinger's paintings here, in these, like, beautiful centerfold illustrations. Just absolutely exquisite. Uh, and unfortunately, this part has fallen apart. I'd be lovely to have a pristine copy of this. But this is what I've got. And there is the inspiration for Godzilla right here. The Tyrannosaurus painting by Zellinger. Zellinger's Tyrannosaurus. You can kind of see that distinct brow ridge in Godzilla in 1954. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and again, Stegosaurus, who also appears in this. Right there is our Stegosaurus. The dorsal plates for Stegosaurus were also used as inspiration, as well as, you heard that correctly, Iguanodon. I think it may have been kind of the Bernisart inspired Iguanodon, like this one right here, it helped inspire the forelimbs of Godzilla. You know? Uh, yeah, so real Tyrannosaurus has got very short four limbs with two fingers. I think it was the arms of this depiction of Iguanodon, this kind of generation of depictions of Iguanodon, that helped inspire the original Tyrannosaur, or the original Godzilla design. They omitted the thumb spikes, obviously. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Very cool stuff. So there you have it. How this incredible work of art from uh, way back in 19... Started in 1942 or 43, depending on who you ask. He was on this very day in 1942 that Rudolf Zellinger was hired by the Yale Peabody Museum to create some artwork, and he created one of the great American pieces of art here. Just exquisite. And it has held, it has had such an impact upon American popular culture, upon paleontologists who would grow up to study dinosaurs. Yeah. So big paleontologizing salute to Rudy Zallinger. A true legend. Anyway, with that being said, it is now time to wrap up today's stream. Started an hour early, so we're ending about an hour early here. Don't go away just yet, though, everybody. We are going to see who else is doing some science. And we're going to go right into them. Hope you learned something today. I hope you had fun. I had a ton of fun with this subject today. Uh, great stuff. Great stuff. So, and holy cow, Victorious, thank you for the five gift subs. Beautiful. Thank you very, very much for that. Victorious just changed things with those five gift subs. Thank you, thank you, Victorious. Exquisite. Do you think dinosaurs are put together correctly? The bones. <laughs> You're smart. What do you think? Do a research I, on that, I, Oliver. I, I never. <laughs> Katie J, thank you, Katie G Tay. Katie J Tay, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah, uh, let's see. Let's see who else is live on Twitch right now, doing some science. Uh, NASA is live apparently. 
I think their chat might be... Oh, it's in slow mode? Let's go raid NASA. We've never done that before. And KDJT, we are going to be streaming again tomorrow on Paleontologizing. I stream every weekday. Yeah. Uh. And they've got a follower or subscriber. Uh, let's unraid. Never mind. Uh. Let's go raid science streams. Uh, we're gonna go see Belint and see what he's up to. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Nat the Squirrel, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. We're gonna be talking about King Kong tomorrow. And how that 1933 film, which pre premiered on March 2nd, 1933, that is tomorrow. Tropical Delta, home of the big plant eaters and of the monsters who chased them. Thank you, Stavaros, for the six months of support. Really appreciate that. Uh, we are going to... Oh, and uh-oh. Hang on. How does this... Oh, shoot. This thing's covered up now. We got a hype train going. Oh, boy. How do I... Ah, darn it. Get rid of this. Hype train... Is the raid going through? I can't even tell. Shoot. We've got too many things going on. Like, it, uh, everything's all covered up. Anyway, we're going to be talking about King Kong tomorrow and how that film helped inspire a generation of paleontologists, too. And uh, how the dinosaur depictions in that were ahead of their time back in 1933. But, uh... And Raid canceled? Okay. Raid. Science streams. It says, I already have a raid in progress. Well, we got a hype train going and... Wait, view all two. There we go. Nine, eight, seven. I hope to see you, uh... Oh, okay. Shoot. It's taken a while. Sorry. It's a live broadcast, everybody. Stuff happens. Wait, hang on. Did we just raid? This is all kinds of messed up. I don't know what's going on. But anyway. Thank you, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you. Let's go see what Science Streams is doing, shall we? We're already there? I guess so. Alright, well, uh... Welcome the heck in. Hello, the Lenina. Hello, Tarquin. Waffles and grapes. Hello, uh, 